At the beginning of every podcast, there's a short segment where something funny is said. This is a placeholder for that segment in the podcast known as... Trapped Under Plastic, the podcast to watch sophisticated artists say pee-pee, poo-poo, and doo doo-doo, unironically. Thank you, Clay Williams, for that lovely artistic intro. You know, also, if I, was, if I was smart, I would have read that. I would have I integrated some one of those words yes. in my fun little intro, yes. and then it would have just transition perfectly god damn, god damn. next day, time one day we'll be good at this next time all right getting straight into the preamble ramble john as per usual has 17 topics and i have one so maybe you should go first <laughs> uh, what did i write sculpting versus painting the point of no return okay so tis the season uh, usually when the when the first snowflakes start to fall oh, or when they've fallen they have fallen and they have fallen here in the state of minnesota yeah. um Vin vincey v and i reconnoiter our relationship mm. and uh we start doing regular uh, hangouts and we do discord video hangouts while we're hobbying mm -hmm. it uses it's usually it's like an hour 45 minutes two hours they get naked you know yeah that's why the video sweaty. that's why the video is <laughs> yeah. of course um and i was working on the sculpting stuff for my my golden demon piece and um I had this revelation, and then Vince and I talked it through, and he confirmed my suspicions, which is always good if you have a Vince nearby to confirm a thought that you have. A Vince, so that's like multiple of them. Is he like a Pokemon? You yeah. can catch him? Yeah, you can have your own Vince. He, he could be named something else. Sure. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Vince confirmed this. So the difference between uh, painting and... And I'll label it as sculpting, but it's more of like a, a creating, whether it's creating a scene, could be a intricate base, could be a scene for a diorama, um, could be something like major kit bashing, you know, or sculpting a miniature. The major difference is in painting, there is very rarely, if ever, the point of no return where you can't go tweak things because they didn't turn out how you wanted to. Or you you say, ah, this blend isn't as good, or this color doesn't work, or the light attention needs to be more up here, the knee shouldn't be so bright. You, you can always fix that. Okay, so there's not really a point of no return there. But in the project that I'm working on for my Golden Demon piece, I did so much um, sketching, so much planning, so much moving shit around in Photoshop with the help of Willie Hanna, so much focus on lighting, so much figuring out exact placements, exact poses, exact turning of heads of models. But at a certain point, you have to do the thing that you can't undo. Now, that's not to say it is 100% not able to be undone. So once I place down this bits of rubble or this dirt or sand grit texture paste or I set the, the levels with milliput or whatever... I could go in there with the grinder and I could grind back out that milliput. Mm -hmm. Sure. You can do that, but it becomes like this massive heavy lift that also has a snowball of effect of like what other things is it implementing. And I got to that point where it really trying to, to, to nail composition in this piece, I realized like even if I had it exactly where I wanted it, exactly what I wanted it to look at, like, like when you get to execution – it, it, not all the there's too many variables it just doesn't all line up perfectly and it was it's you get as very close as you can you find how much if something isn't exactly right how much hoops are you willing to jump through for that three percent angle change on one figure doing one thing or when you finally glued down the head on the model so he's looking exactly this way. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly right. Is it close enough? Is it not? Yeah. yeah. So I, I just, I never realized how much more stressful that part is than with this project. Yeah, some people assemble plastic models intentionally with super glue so they can take them apart later on, which never made sense to me for like the wargaming hobbyists. Because I feel like especially those people want to just like, set it and forget it and it's like why not use plastic glue for its extra strength but yeah if you did a competition piece in plastic glue and say you wanted to change the angle of the head to make a point like more camera center um you're gonna damage that model like unrepairably and you're going to need to fix it which yep. then opens the door for liability like yes. repairing it poorly right yeah 
So I'm curious, did you assemble the models with super glue or no? As like a insurance measure? <sighs> uh, good question. Good question. So I did everything with a plastic cement with sprue goo to have the smoothest transitions. However, I did not put the heads on any of the models. Mm -hmm. I also didn't put any of the shields on any, any of the models. And I built them and did some slight alterations to poses of the bodies based on how I wanted their posture to be. And then I can move them so they're more open to the scene and more closed so there's differentiation. Once I got the scene all set up exactly how I wanted it, I then uh, plastic cement glued on the heads so they'd be right at the angle right then and there. When I had it, all the scene set up, this is exactly where I want each head to be looking. Because at a certain point, you, you have to do that, I guess, unless you're going to paint the head on a little paper clip separate, which I just never have done. You never do that? No, I never do that. Okay. I mean, I see the value in it. I have done it. Like, I did it for a teaching classes when I did the um, uh, TMX Expo. Mm -hmm. I did the face painting class. Yeah. Those were all separate. Um, but it, I don't as – lo as long as it's not f too obscured, I, I haven't really felt the need for that. And then there's the dude on a horse. I have that dude, the rider, is completely separate. I, so I can pull him off, so I'll paint him separate. And I actually have the whole head of the horse. It kind of chops – right at the neck where there's like a bridle thing so it's a clean line so you're not gonna have to gap fill that i have the head that of the horse that i can pull off mostly because i was kind of nervous of whether or not i could pull the rider on and off with the horse head still attached so mm. that might be glued on but yeah yeah that's what i did i just figured at a certain point like you have to i was hemming and hawing on this shit for like i've been working on this for like four full work days and that was this is after having done all the composition work, all the sketches, all the reworks before I ever built anything. Mm -hmm. And then I went through the whole extent of setting the whole thing up, cut out all these like cork steps that were different areas were cut, were cut off. So I'd have elevation changes that were all cut in circles to the size of the plinth. And then that I could do like a, a, a rough end of where each figure would stand and how it would look in full three dimensions as opposed to on paper. And, the the plinth was too big mm -hmm. i realized it was too it was it, they were too spread apart and it was not by a ton but it was enough to where like i feel i notice it like each figure could stick their if if they were real boys and they stuck their arms out um they could touch each other if everyone's arms were out they could touch each other's arms but not by a lot mm -hmm. so they just felt so i went through all of that work and i big, scrapped yeah. it and the whole purpose of that was that plinth was a wood was a wood plinth that I could use on my disc sander to have perfectly smooth all the way around. Mm. The smaller size is a resin one from Tarot Model Maker. Mm -hmm. And I was scared as shit to put that to the sander. Am I going to be able to bring it back? Oh, for sure you'll be able to. Um yeah. Uh do you have a do you have a grinding wheel? Yes. Yeah, a little bit of wax, a little buff on that at the very end after sanding, you'll 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 kill that thing. This whole wax period is I did done it over the course of two days and I still have this afternoon I go back to the final step. But I, yes, you're right. Or sorry, not a gr uh yeah, a, a grinder, not an angle grinder. The the stationary one with the big yes. has a big buffing wheel attachment. Um okay. The reversing in time a little bit to the head discussion. Yes. I generally don't mind doing that with GW models because they snap into their slot like so nicely. And so what that means for me is once I have a fully painted head, I don't got to fuck with it so much to get it to fit into where it's supposed to fit into. True. Because modern GW kits are kind of like Legos. It's gonna, it kind of just drops in. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel especially okay painting them uh, by themselves. And I like to be able to hold a head and completely go horizontal with it and then sneak my brush up like under noses, under cheeks, under chins, like and, and like get like in like eyes and tear duct areas. And if there's like features in the way preventing me from getting fu fully horizontal, True. then it kind of is a little bit annoying. But also, the best part about having a head on a piece of cork is that all of my fingertips and all of my control get to be right by that head. So everything's like I, I'm not I'm not an inch away. I'm not a half an inch away. I'm like fucking millimeters away. So I'm just like fully locked in. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, if it, you don't need to do that, you don't need to do that. Yeah, I, you're, it's, it probably would be, it probably is the better thing, um, especially if I'm doing like a single model or a competition piece that is for like a duo or something yeah. like that. Oh, it's for it's, sure, yeah. It's like I get a level of overwhelm as I'm working on, on a project like this because then I like look and think of everything all at once. Mm. And then I'm just like kind of get overwhelmed and I'm like, no, I'm, I ain't got time for that. I got to <laughs> just, I just got to get to work. Um, so, but you're right. Um, but luckily one of the figures is kind of one of those, um, it's the kind of guy that looks like a young boy. He's got a, uh, a head in a box. <laughs> that guy's like a, a, and it's not a snap fit piece, but he's one of those where his head isn't separate. It's like part of his chest yeah. and everything. And so I'm not going to cut that off. No, no, but he's no. also very open. Like you can get all the way around his head cause there's nothing close. Um, same with the the dude on the horse. Like he's just kind of sitting up, and he doesn't have the the problems you have is if dudes with arms and shit in the way. Yeah. You know, that's where things can get real hairy. Yeah, yeah. You know, but what was in the box? What's in the box? It, the head's in the box. Okay, it's uh, it's not a dick in a box. It's Brad Pitt's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Her head. Two, two different references. <laughs> oh, oh, it's not a dick, oh, in, oh, a a dick in a box, and you went seven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, that'd be sweet if I like re sculpted that head in the box to look like Gwyneth Paltrow's face. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know if sweet's the right word. Uh, imagine in seven, he's like, What's in the box? and it's a dick, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a big floppy pink dildo. And he pulls it out, and he's like, ah, 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 and He has the same reaction, he's like, just crying. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's awesome. No, <laughs> no. Uh, so I was browsing the good old YouTubes, and I and I got a video recommended to me that had about 1,000, 2,000 views. It had Mr. Beast's face in the thumbnail, and it was some gaming video about board games. Um, and I'm like, surely this video is just putting Mr. Beast's face in the thumbnail because they just want to get more views. Because sure. like, it had 1,000, 2,000 views. It was, like, it was really low. And so I clicked on it, and I watched it. And um, Mr. Beast loves the board game and potentially other ones uh called dune imperium um which is a really fucking good game uh, i've played it twice um and he loves it so much that he reached out to this youtube channel uh, or an organization to create an invite only dune imperium tournament <laughs> that he played in and that he was a finalist in oh, and man. was at the final table of four remaining players because you can play four players in dune imperium and so he was at, at the final table uh, he competed all the way until the end. So not only is he interested in it enough to like have a an event run, but also he's got fucking game and chops too. Wow! So like, what a, the fuck? Is it like a high skill ceiling game that you you played it? So do you kind yeah, of you see that? It's a it's a midway Euro game, and so like like there's no dice, there's there's very little randomness, there's there's card drawing and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's there's a lot going on. There's a lot of resource controlling. There's combat in the game as well. Mm. They were playing an expansion of the game. I'm not totally sure how it's different. Um, but I would say that board games, and maybe I'm wrong because I'm not super deep into that hobby. I'm pretty deep. I feel like board games are a little bit lower skill ceiling than miniature war games, um, but it's still like high enough to play in a tournament like enjoyably. And if there are, like, I don't know how many people were in the tournament. I'm guessing it was, like, 60, 50, something like that. Damn. If he's getting at the – I don't know. That, that could be wrong. It could be 30. It could be 10. Uh, if he's getting to the end there, he's got to be pretty good, you know? Wow. But, like, that's crazy. Like, I, I keep finding out more things about this guy. Uh, I don't know how he has time to do all the stuff he does, but it's, it, was fun to, it was fun to find that, that out. Well, how many employees does he have now? It's like they have teams that work. They, oh, they for have, sure. For sure. They, they have got project teams that each team is, like, in charge of a different video, basically. Yeah. But, I also – he, he, in an interview, he said his work schedule. And he's like, basically, I just work nonstop until I'm burnt out, and then I take a day or two off, and then I do it again. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Oh, yeah. Like, he, like that is his life, too. Yeah. Like, he doesn't have yes. family. He doesn't yeah. have kids. He doesn't, like, you've seen the stuff where it's, like, his house is, like, he doesn't have a big fancy house or whatever. Yeah, he does that things. intentionally. He doesn't. He doesn't necessarily care to have a big fancy house. He spends all his money back into the channel. Yeah. Um... Yeah, anyways, that that was cool Wild. to figure that out. Wild. That's, yeah. I mean, I guess it doesn't surprise me because it takes a certain kind of personality to kind of do what he does that's so, like, intensely doing a thing as hard and as far as you could, like, pass the point of comfortability from the normal person, yeah. which is part of the success of the, the channel is because it's just so 
it's very big picture, right? Yeah. You can see big picture and then make small changes to move his channel in that direction, which is like all about like big board games are like. It's like I have a goal. There are a million things I can do to get to that goal. I'm going to optimize the steps to get to that that end goal. Um, so I guess there's definitely some similarity there. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's a that's a fun little side note. I know. <laughs> it, was just, it was interesting. Um, I think I pulled in two of mine in that one, so I'm, we're going to – Oh, did you? We're going to do that. Because my next thing was like full ball sack pre-painting, which I kind of mm. discussed there was like how much I really like. And it's part of the premise. And as as of the recording of this podcast, I have not written the script for this next video, which is the the building of my golden demon piece. And the, my my bloodline for that video is I, I fucked up last year before I ever took my paintbrush out. I fucked up. Um, I lost before I ever started the race. Is it that dramatic? I kind of think so. I kind of think like I'm really proud of the painting work that I did on that piece. Um, but I just like it didn't make a strong piece um, when it was complete. The composition uh, I lost because of that is my main thing. Um, relatively speaking, relatively obviously, because because it's only compared to the things that were there, and e and even then, we're comparing pieces of art. So yeah. I, I I wouldn't get too down on yourself. I think GD is a little bit more of a crapshoot than it than it seems. Which is not to say that they're doing anything wrong. It's just difficult, you know, when you get to this high level of miniature painting to really figure out what's what's right and what's wrong and what's deserving of a gold and not deserving of a gold mm -hmm. um so it's a really nice uh piece i don't think yeah, it, yeah. I'm, ha I'm happy when i will go go buy my display cases and i see it in there it makes me happy good, I'm, good. I'm glad that i have it good I'm, and you know there was a point where i was going to um redo the whole base composition take all the models off of that and redo the piece post golden demon yeah and i was going to enter it for this upcoming year's golden demon now the plus side of that is i don't have to fucking paint the figures <laughs> <laughs> but i decided that like there's a level of in, at least to me personally that that's not healthy that i need to let a thing live and let it let it be its own artifact in my history totally and not not try to to change but rather to learn from and sure. so and to take from that and, and to start anew and that's what I've d been doing here and so I really have focused on and I've really reached out to a lot of awesome people our our group of the four horsemen included um, to figure out like ask for help you know and ask for advice and and to not be too tied to any idea or decision that I make um, before I get too invested in it like I try to keep this project at arm's reach until I really am happy with the composition. And I think I'm there. Am I 100% happy? No, but just like you're never going to be 100% happy with the final paint job. But I feel really strong about it. And so I really was like I, I need to invest a lot more time on the front end to set myself up for success. So that was kind of the – we'll see what happens with, with, the, with the video and – you know, it's it's not uh, a battle of warlord titans, but it is making a scene. <laughs> it's making a, a much smaller scene, um, much smaller, more intentional in scene in in Warhammer. But my last thing I wanted to talk about because we just uh, we just passed the Halloween season. Mm -hmm. Did you go trick or treating? No, but I I uh, put some candy out for some 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 kids, some go ghouls and goblins. Yes. Um. The are are you a put a bowl on the steps person? Yeah, just because of the two dogs, yep. like they just bark so much whenever someone rings the doorbell. Yep, and they still ring the doorbell when you put the bowl out there, but they do it much less. So that that's the only reason why. Okay, yeah, that's cool too. We did that too. We put the bowl out because we kind of had a Halloween get together. It's kind of something that I've developed into tradition. Yeah, I've heard. Um, I've heard of these parties. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, and it's not that party. Oh, okay. We didn't do that party. My With wife, Joshy's parents, and yeah, shit. we we did we did not do that this year. We went to a play, uh, a local play at the okay. theater, cool. and then we uh, went out to eat, and then we just had some drinky poos downtown, and went home, called it a night. It was great. But uh, at on actual Halloween, um, I bring over like my brother, my sister in law, their three kids, our good friends that are our neighbors. Um, when they're two girls and then my mom and dad 
they all come over to our house, so then my parents get to see all the little kids in their costumes. And then I order a shitload of pizzas, and then my mom brought homemade taco dip. Mm. Oh, man, that was so good. Seven-layer taco dip. Yeah, and the sister-in-law made a giant uh, uh, chocolate and vanilla frosting cake that It's in the shape of a skull. Okay. It was great. And so then we all go trick-or-treating. My mom and dad stay at our house because it's balls cold this year. Yeah, dude. That was not pleasant. Um, so we all go out in our, my neighborhood and go trick-or-treating, and they stay home. But we still put the bowl of candy out on the steps, mostly because if my massive dog decided he just wanted to go out and go trick-or-treating with the whatever kids come to our house, <laughs> my parents couldn't stop him. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, and he's- Is he, he full grown now? Uh, he'll be two on December 1st, so- yeah, he's as tall as he's ever going to be, but he's going to continue to put on mass. Yeah. Like, he's put on more mass in the last six months. He's probably put on 30 pounds. Okay. <laughs> he's just like a thick sausage. He's not fat. He's just solid as a rock. But <laughs> So we went trick-or-treating, and it was, as of that morning, there was like three inches of snow on the ground. Yeah. It was 31 degrees, and there was 30-mile-an-hour winds. <laughs> okay, I don't remember the winds. The <laughs> winds were terrible that morning. By evening, we're kind of up on the hill and in, in the woods, so the, the trees cut a lot of it, but it was still cold as balls in the morning when I walked the dog. But by evening, the wind had died down, and by just, like, wearing, bundling up a bit and then just walking all over the place, it was it was great. It was great. We, we went to about – we have a, not a lot of houses up in our neighborhood, but we went to – I counted 16 houses is all. And my daughter filled up her candy bag two times. In 16, in 16 ha- houses. Yeah. Everyone's super generous because you don't get a ton of yes. kids. Is that why? There's three groups of <laughs> okay. trick or treaters okay. on our hill. That's and we're sick, one of them. actually. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. I expected in the 10 plus years that we've been there that like sooner or later the word would get out and you'd get the. You get the other people from other neighborhoods coming up to trick or treat in your neighborhood. Oh. They realize. Oh. Like. <laughs> like. It's not that like it's a. It's not. There is a rich section like uh, further up the hill where like newer houses that are rich people built up there but all these houses in my area are built in like the late 80s they're nice but they're not ni- nothing fancy but the people like if you just give one king size candy bar like that's the that's the bar the bar minimum seriously a lot of our neighbors because they all know like my daughter and then the neighbors their two girls and they know like my brother's kids now too because we're the only ones that go trick-or-treating we've been doing it for like six years and they know them, and so they make bags of candy. Each kid has their own bag of candy. Oh, my gosh. It's like an Easter basket. Yeah, it's the greatest. So then we get back home, and I get to go and look through. I, <laughs> my daughter and I, everyone leaves. I'm like, get the fuck out of my house. I get to go look at the candy now. And we, we sit on her bed, and she oh, she pours it all out, and we spread it all out, and it's just it just takes me back to when I was a kid. Yeah, dude. And then I'm like, it's time to pay the dad tax. <laughs> you steal some for the emergency uh, stash? Yeah, so it's like, well, if I know what things she doesn't like. You know, she and, a whopper hater. No, she's not a whopper hater. She she is rightly a disliker of mounds and almond joys. Because what yeah. child likes mo- mounds yeah. and almond joys? Yeah, I also don't like those. So we're in a conundrum there. <laughs> um, so it made me think. You know, like what is there certain Halloween candies that really like is your favorite one? Is it the ones that you buy at the store when you get Halloween candies because you know you like them? Or you don't buy them because you know you'll eat them all. Yeah, I feel like I'm a basic bitch and I like Snickers. But I'll say that I went to my friend's house this past weekend to watch the International, which is like a big video game tournament for Dota 2. Mm -hmm. uh, It wasn't a big prize pool this year. I don't know why, but it normally is like $20 million. Um, And uh, Amber, my friend's wife, also named Amber, um bought a ton of candy i don't know i don't know why but she did and man i've never eaten more candy bars in my life and one that really shocked shocked me was that payday has a chocolatey payday oh i've had this and they're fucking good yeah they are dude and so i ate a bazillion chocolatey paydays and a bazillion uh take five candy bars take five with that pretzel in there yeah dude and holy cow, those were amazing. So I would get up and go to the stash. I'd get a, I'd get a payday, and I'd get a take five, and I'd go sit down in my fucking chair, and I'd watch fucking Dota. 
and I'd yeah. get up every ten minutes <laughs> for seven hours, and then I'd eat thirty candy bars. <laughs> no, it was, it was uh, yeah, those two are are really good though. Oh, that's that's a good call. I mean, I like when you when you get stuff like that. That's not like your usual wheelhouse. Yeah, like, yeah. Like we all love the peanut buddy cups. Yeah, yeah. You love the Snickers. You know, you'll you'll eat the Kit Kats and the Twix. You yeah. know, it's kind of tier two. Yeah, second class citizens. <laughs> totally. But, but you eat them. Yeah. Um. You know, like the mini Snickers in the freezer. Like that's my. Uh, you like frozen oh, candy dude. bars? I do. I like frozen candy bars. Um, dude, Rolo is dude. Yeah, they're pretty good. Well, yeah. you like see when you freeze caramel stuff, then it kind of gets chewy. Yeah, I don't. I don't do Rolos in the okay, freezer. Okay, I was okay. just. I just thought Very of Rolos. Important. I just okay. thought of Rolos, <laughs> okay. so I said Rolos. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Rolos are great, but yeah, the when you get something like that, that's not your usual thing. Like I don't got my way to buy take fives. Yeah. But then you know, like once a year, once every two years, you have a take five. You're like, fuck, dude, this yeah, is great. Dude. Yeah, dude. You ever had the Reese's sticks? They're like a, no, I don't. They're think like so. a. Uh, a Kit Kat, okay. but they're Reese's and they're slightly bigger. They're more like those those uh, wafer things that oh, they the, come in the, the nutty buddy things. You know those like the wafers that come in like strawberry, chocolate, or vanilla. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. Do you like that? No, they're not that good. You don't like them? I love fucking wafery things. Yeah, wafer wafer cookie thingies. They're kind of like that, but they're like it's Reese's peanut butter between the wafers and then covered in chocolate, dude. Those things are money, man. I don't know if you can get those at Halloween candies. Final thing that I freaking love, <laughs> and my daughter does too. So we had like we almost like had a duel to the death to get her Krabby Patties. You ever had the, the Krabby Patties, SpongeBob like Krabby Patties? It's a gummy thing. Yeah, they're like a gummy burger. I've had gummy burgers, but not a Krabby Patty one. Yeah, dude, like Krabby Patties have taken over the gummy burger industry. <laughs> Like the regular gummy burgers, not even available. Seriously, yeah, Mr. Crab just like put them all out of business. God so damn. yeah, next time you go through the the grocery store candy aisle, you'll find Krabby Patties, okay. and I implore you. Okay, are they good? They're fucking amazing. What? Dude. They're amazing. Does it tastes better than normal gummy burgers. Hundred percent. What the fuck are they doing? Here's it's that the, secret recipe, bro. Yeah, do you want to hear it? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can explain please, it to you. <laughs> please. Okay, so here's why they're amazing. So each. Krabby Patty consists of four parts. <laughs> <laughs> this is an episode of SpongeBob right now. Okay, you got the upper bun, the lower bun, the lettuce, and the burger. <laughs> what the pickle, dude? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It's, maybe it is a pickle. It's you hiding them under your tongue, dude? It's either the pickle or the the lettuce. It's a green thing and it's semi translucent. It's the only trans semi translucent gummy in the burger. A little mysterious. Okay, so here's why they're awesome. Each of the four pieces of a Krabby Patty have a different gummy consistency. What? Yes. They did way more R&D than they needed to. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> like, there is the firm gummy, which is the, the pickle slash lettuce, whichever green thing is. There is the middle one, which is the burger, which is, like, the middle consistency. It's not as firm, but it's not super soft. And and then the upper and lower bun are the softest, but they're different shapes. And the upper bun is more poofy. They got the round and the, the flat. Yeah, <laughs> oh dude, God. you just sit there and enjoy that one piece at a time. <laughs> oh, that's what you do. Yeah. Do you, are you a psychopath that like will take an Oreo part and eat it piece by piece? No. Okay. No. But, but the the gummy the gummy Krabby Patties though. Yeah. Like, what are you gonna do? You lick out the frosting of an Oreo, then it's like you're just depressed as you I, eat I the know. second half of the Oreo. I'll never understand. Just enjoy it all together. Yeah. You know. Well, that's the preamble. Right? <laughs> Do Amazing. you like Krabby Patties? <laughs> you know, if they sold Lion Bars in America for in the Halloween section, I would be in heaven because yeah. Lion Bars are probably my favorite candy bar on the planet. But uh, it's Canada and the UK, I think, is where you get those. But, yeah, I think so. I came um, in our UK gift bag. Let us know in the comments section what is an underrated Halloween candy that you enjoy much like the Krabby Patty, because I am all for going to try new things. Okay, okay. <laughs> Especially if it's candy. Maybe next time we, we do a we do a candy tier list. No, okay, Just okay. Do, oh, one final note on this. <laughs> God, I actively avoid the grocery store and Target for like four or five days after Halloween because I don't want to be enticed by clearance Halloween candy. Okay. Because they mark that shit down so much. Yeah, dude. If you're there like one to three days after Halloween, I mean, you could just eat candy for the next year and a half. That sounds amazing. Yeah, like a whole bag is like 70 cents. (laughs) And it used to be $13 the week before Halloween. And you don't want that? Well, I do want that. That's why I don't go there because I would buy it and I would eat it all. Yeah. So just word of the wise, this is your, you know. (laughs) 
You've been warned. Been warned. All right, on to what we painted. So I, I think I must have mentioned this before in the past, but um, I, I, me and Curtis are preparing for the recorded uh, Kill Your Friends version of A Song of Ice and Fire. We're getting some practice in because he's using Boltons for the first time. And we're trying to figure out what a good list would be to fight against each other uh, for, for both of our armies, Greyjoys and Boltons. Um, and the first game we played, we... Uh, um, I gave him his best scenario that he could ever get, which is called Feast for Crows. Uh, and I'm, I ran the most anti-Bolton list I ever could as a Greyjoy player, just to see in a perfect world where both factions are like at, at max strength, like what's going to happen? And I fucking crushed him. Uh, and so then this time, I stepped back a little bit, and we did a different scenario, changed some things, and it was a super close game. This was last night. He won like 10 to 8. Oh, that's so, so we're getting a little closer now. That, that game would have been good to record. I think there was a lot of really cool moments in that one. And so we're trying to figure things out. And so in figuring things out, I'm trying out new commanders, mm -hmm. trying out new attachments, new NCUs, non-combat units, and I'm painting up a bunch of uh, one-off minis right now. Um, so I painted uh, Balon Grey Joy a second time. Fucker. Um, oh, because he had the sp he guys he was yeah, a victim he, of the spooge. He was one of the victims of the spooge. Sp spooge Gate 2023. <laughs> yeah, spooge Gate. Uh, and then I also painted up Euron Greyjoy. Oh, fucking Euron, buddy. So Euron, I painted his face uh, in that the new AP Fanatic paint line, which I'll talk about later in the extended portion of the podcast. Um, but I also painted this guy um, like like you painted your Tyranid model. I didn't go crazy with the undercoats. I did, I did just one dark blue undercoat, and then I hided everything up from there. And so good. Yeah, it does. It's it shockingly looks shockingly looks really good. Um, so the one thing that I had the the most struggle with um, was the the cream color, because mm -hmm. um, uh, going from dark navy blue to that that color with like a thin uh, uh, paint was challenging without getting it looking a little bit kind of grainy and bad. But I were I eventually worked it up after a couple layers of translucent layering and it looked fine. Um, but his face is all fanatic paints, and I'll talk to you more about that later in the extended portion of the episode, like your technique on that. Um, so that was that was that guy. Really happy with the golden eye patch. That was uh, that was yeah. Evan's idea. Yeah. I, and then uh, the, I wanted to put gold higher up on the model because I wanted to paint the trim of his waistband gold and his axe thing gold. And I was like, I need more gold somewhere else. I want to put in like I want to paint some of these scales gold. But how do I paint it? Do I give him like the Star Trek like? upper left breast patch, you know? <laughs> or do I give him, like, a stripe? Yeah. And then Malev was like, you should just paint them randomly. Like, they've been, been broken and replaced. And I was like, that's fucking great. It works, it, dude. It does. So that, and then Evan was like, also the eye patch. I'm like, god damn. So stream came together Yeah. for the for that gold, man. Yeah. It, it's great because you there's no pattern to the, the few gold ones. Yes. Because, you know, we want pattern. And so when it's obviously not a pattern, it, it works so much better. Yeah. So that was Euron. It was pretty, pretty, pretty fun painting him. I, this is a good model. Like I, the pose is good. It is. Is there's the right amount of detail. Yep. You know, Grant. You know, it is seam on plastic. Although it's their newer plastic, so it's nicer. Um. So there's the edges aren't as as crisp as if it was a GW, but they're not bad. No, like, they're not bad. It's just I also just think this figure looks fucking badass he does look badass yeah. yeah you got you got the coolest boy here and he kind of lost the end of his nose a little bit so he yeah, kind of saw that looks a little like a, like an undead person right. like he's missing his, his tip of his nose uh, <laughs> i mean that's more than the tip it's just most of his nose is gone. <laughs> he's got kind of a flat face yeah. but if you look at him straight on you can't tell because yeah. like the, the shape of the nose is there and you kept some some shadows on either side I which tried, is important i tried <laughs> to make like a regular nose yeah uh but yeah pretty happy with him um, I painted Balon over here, who I was unhappy with the first time I painted them, and I'm still kind of unhappy with them again. Um, he's a fucking hard model to paint, man. His face is super challenging. Something about the combination of the details on his model. I'm just not, like, landing colors in the right spot. I don't like the cream color of, like, his that, that top part of his, like, uh, shirt or jerkin next to that teal. Mm, yeah, it, doesn't, it that. doesn't look good. It looks great on the sleeve, though. Yeah, yeah. So originally I painted that flipped up part right next to his white shirt a different color, brown leather, <clears throat> like the interior of his cloak was a different color. Yeah. But that looked bad too. It kind of like subdivided the top half and the bottom half of the model. What if you did it the dark blue that this guy's cloak is? Well, I wonder if painting the rest of the cloak this dark blue and keeping the teal color there would be fine. So instead of a dark color, it was a light color that was like the border color? 
I think the issue is the light undershirt right next to the light teal. Yeah, so maybe that's, that's the that's the tough part. I really like the teal cloak everywhere else because you have the nice separation in the dark of his hair and the dark of the scabbard. Um, it really outlines the cool parts of his chest really well. It's just that one part. Yeah, it, yeah. So maybe I mean, maybe even something as simple as just some more heavy recess shading, like a dark line. To that's separate. true. I don't know. Yeah, that could that could do it. Yeah, you just give a nice dark line separation in there. Yeah. Even use like that blue as mm. your dark line. Yeah, that or I could hit it with the contrast paint that's like like Leviathan blue thinned uh, down a yeah. little bit. Just, just see what that does. Doop it in. His face was so hard to paint. He's looks so pouty right now. But man, that's like that's like ten attempts to like paint that that mouth. Cause like it was so weird. I was painting the the, the mouth and in one orientation it looked fine. And then I would look at it on camera and what stream saw, and he looked like a fucking idiot. He looked so stupid. And I was like, what is happening? You are you are fighting a very subpar sculpt. Dude, on this a model, yeah. On a figure where the, the face is really an important part you know, of the model. He's, he's so proud looking. Yeah. yeah. His chin is up and like there's there's nothing around his neck. Like it's really drawing your eye up there. Yeah. And I can certainly tell that you did a lot of sculpting with paint here. I tried, yeah. It was it was tough. Uh, everything is so is so shallowly defined, if I can say that. Um, yes. And it's like you really you, you start to lose it after a couple layers of paint, and so you gotta you gotta pick your battles wisely when when painting models like this. And yeah, I, th I think I got to a point where I was like, I don't really know where the lips are anymore. <laughs> no, I think it looks great. Knowing how difficult this would be to paint, yeah, I painted them again second time now, and both times were challenging. Yeah. The way that I would have approached this head would not have worked for using it as a game model, um, <clears throat> because I would have gone very um, atmospheric, very stark, where there's a lot of changes from like a bright right on his forehead and the upper cheek, and then it goes really dark. But that doesn't work for a game because then you'd you'd have to continue that through the whole model and yeah. that would be a totally different paint scheme yeah yeah else. it might and, work though yeah i, I for I, like a whole army if you did it if you did it like that yeah yeah I don't, I don't know i've never i've never really seen that yeah i think it's possible as long as like you've got to punch it to 11 for the areas that you're really drawing attention to yeah like the important parts like the shape of the model like yeah. like lips cheekbones like chin like maybe a little bit of forehead bridge of the nose like those those things like make a face yeah and that just like that the parts of that scale mail that's really catching the light are really shiny and mm -hmm. like just draws you in the problem with doing that in a, a gaming mini is you have certain angles of holding the mini where it doesn't look good and when you're on the table you know they kind of have to have i don't want to say ideal angle to make the light work that's not what i'm saying i'm just saying there are certain parts that are naturally going to fall into a lot of shadow that just aren't as interesting to look at because you're not seeing the the, the part that really is drawing your eye yeah you know like you as the commander when you're seeing your dude's butts the whole game yeah it's going to be much more boring than your paint jobs are for this so that's why yeah so to finish my army for this video, I'm gonna have to. I'm going to Europe for a fucking full week. Oof. Oh, a lot of time. A lot of time away from the the old paint desk. Well, I'll be painting in Europe. Uh, I'll be painting. Uh, but you won't be painting Simon plastic. Oh no, no, me and Roman are gonna paint the Ghoul Queen from Mind War Games, a model I bought a while ago. She reminds me of Bav Morda from Willow. Bav Morda. She's got she's got big evil witch energy. What's uh, what's her name again? I want to look up the model. Ghoul Queen. Ghoul Queen. Maybe maybe Blair can show a picture of her on the screen right now. Yeah, me. yeah, that'd be cool. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna be gone for like a week. I'm gonna come back, and then I think I'm gonna have one week to paint the rest of my Greyjoy army, which is not insane because I have a lot of characters painted. I have uh, 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 units painted. So I don't have that much more left to do, uh, but it'll be a little bit of a mad dash to paint that army in that week to get it all finished up. But then if I do accomplish that, um, I'll have two painted armies. Oh, man. I yeah Okay, this is the Brom, one of the yeah, Brom, Brom pieces. I have, a, I have a history with that original artwork because that original art piece came out when I was a young, impressionable, nerdy, Seriously? nerdy teen. That's cool. Yeah, 14, 15 years of age. And it was featured in a magazine that I had a, a, a subscription to. It was a magic magazine called Inquest. And like whenever I see that picture, it just like takes me back. I remember that. And I remember like looking at that thinking it was so cool. And 
Um, like that really, that piece particularly got me into Brahm and learning about all his stuff and wow. finding pieces that he did because his art style is just so fucking awesome. Wow. So yeah, I'm really excited to see what you guys do with that. Um, yeah. I mean the, the, just the concept with her eyes rolled into the back of her head. Yeah. That, that idea is so cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited too. I'm excited for what Roman wants to talk about. Like, um, he was the one that reached out to me and was like, hey, like, uh, like I'll, let's do a thing. I'm like, uh, okay, sure, let's do a thing. Um, so I don't know what the lesson's going to necessarily be about. That's uh, that's going to be so fun. I'm excited to have a, a full recap on, on Trapped Under Plastic. <laughs> so yeah, Monty Sansovino and, and that. Yeah, it's going yeah, to be lots gonna, to talk gonna, about. Oh, man. I fully expect, like, um, Steel Hard and Steel Conan Scott to come back to be like, <laughs> I, I have decided... I I am ready for what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm excited about. I don't know what you're ready for. You're like I am going to win something <laughs> amazing with my painting. I'm definitely going to bring a couple display models uh to throw into whatever category. I'm not sure what. Um oh, I have to register those pieces. I forgot about that. Uh Roman told me that. Uh so I got to figure out which one of my display models are the best looking ones. Maybe the Duchess, probably the Ranger, um, maybe that, maybe that fade model. There are some sussy parts on that that paint job, though. So I, I had to pick a couple. Maybe the Chef bust. Yeah. Um, or Pizza and, Boy too. Or Pizza Boy. I yeah. think Pizza Boy is, is a, tells a really good. Uh, it's an art, artistic expression. Yeah, which I think you know? probably works but, uh, best at MSS. Yep. Um, yes, it does. So yeah, I'll, I have to figure out how to transport that shit. I don't have a great way of doing that yet. Um, but yeah, I'll give that a shot. It, depending on how many it is, shoot, I wish we had had this conversation prior. I could have brought up my case. You could have brought oh, that. Oh, yeah. That one. Because I can, I can bring a suitcase and... That I... When I went to Nova, that was my... I took that as your, your whatever, your extra item. Not your carry-on, but your little extra item. Mm -hmm. And that size case fits under the foot, your foot spot. Okay. So what I ended up doing is like when they all sit down and get on the plane, you put it under there. And then bef after they go do that check before they take off, I just set it on my lap. I was lucky enough on the way there, there was no one in the seat next to me, and I just put it in the seat next to me. Did but you seatbelt it? I did not. <laughs> but, like, when we went through stuff, I found myself being like a mom in the car. Where I was, like, <laughs> threw my arm over so I wouldn't move. Yeah. But, um, yeah, when you have the poster tack around the edges of the base and stuff. Shit ain't moving. Um, but, yeah, I found, too, is like, oh, when I was on my lap, I could sit there and I just have like my phone out because, of course, you're on the, the ghetto small planes that don't have screens. So mm -hmm. I just sit there and watch something mm -hmm. and my kind of arms are resting on top of it. So it wasn't uncomfortable. Okay. Okay. But if you end up needing something, you get, don't have anything else, you can certainly borrow it. It is an hour and 15 minute drive, but <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it depends. You might be able to wrap stuff up in bubble wrap. Um, so maybe. Now, let's talk about a little bit about what I painted. And then did you want to do a little preface on like this trip? Because I don't think the Go to PPs have heard much about it yet. Maybe not. A whole, we'll do a whole discussion later. But did you want to chat about it just a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. So what I painted was um, half of a model. I painted fucking hack. <laughs> I painted the important part. <laughs> Don't look from that angle. <laughs> other than if you it look up look at the, other than if you look up at the puppy's face from that angle. Oh, hello. <laughs> so this is a, a dwarf holding a pug puppy, um, and this is by Durgan Paint Forge, uh -huh. and this is a 3D sculpt. Um, so I backed a Kickstarter. He's got a Kickstarter going on right now. I think it still will still be going on when this episode goes live. It's a new one with a lot of orcs and stuff, but you can also get his back catalog. And he does something wonderful that more people are starting to do where you can back on Kickstarter um, to get the f resin models that he will send to you, or you can buy packs of the STLs. I love his stuff. He's such, he's such a great sculptor, so much um, just personality in his pieces. And um, so I'm like, I'm going to back the STL file pack. And it was like 18, 20 models, and it cost me 40 bucks. And I'm like, geez, man, that's so great. Um, and so this is one of them. And it was the, the point of the video was kind of like showcase when 3D printing and the painting aspect of it was to show once you kind of get into the painting and you do something, if you're, you got your printer dialed in, you kind of lose that this was a 3D print. Now, if you look really closely from some certain angles in the underside of the back, you might be able to see the little, some little divots. So I didn't clean it 
a hundred percent perfectly, but you can, you can clean it. So the, all those divots are gone. Um, and the, the, the pre supports on these are solid. They're not great. Um, but they're good. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't really have any problems with it. So I just did, the. I did the same thing that you did with your Greyjoy guy here where I did some under priming, warm from the front into his right, cool from below and back to his left. Um, so we have a kind of a dual light scheme and then just built off the warm side of the direction of the strong light of the interesting pose. Now, the tough part about painting this, this is actually in hindsight. And I was while I was painting this, I was talking to Vince. I'm like, this was not the right model to pick for this <laughs> because you have two figures basically nose to nose that you can't the angle light thing is very hard to pull off yeah because you have two angles you want to care about right yes and so you really it, it was just it was a kind of a, i realized that when i was like five hours into painting i'm like ah this was wrong but <laughs> it was still it was still really fun and it was a it was a new it was a challenge i realized in the moment and then i had to try to find a way to solve Sure. And uh, did I solve it correctly? Probably not. But I still wanted to dr to have enough of that, that cool light pushed up and over-exaggerated on the face of the puppy because I think that's an important part. Mm -hmm. So the highlighting up and the cool tones on the puppy's face, which is supposed to almost be like a black because uh, a lot of the pugs have like a real dark fade to dark on their faces, and then to push up the highlights of that that cool light there's also not a lot of cool highlights done on the back <laughs> that would then be there to make it more uniform yeah um there's a there's a, a cute little story built into this piece mm -hmm. there's a his backpack has a hole chewed into it that has a piece of cheese falling out of it and the pug has a piece of fabric in his mouth yes uh that is so fucking cute. And he has a little toy. So this, this is his dog. Like, yes. Otherwise, why would he have the toy? And he's scolding the puppy for doing something wrong, but you can tell he really cares about that puppy. That's so cute. He's got, you know, he's got some adventuring stuff on there, but he's got a frying pan on the back. He's got his crossbow because he's an actual, you know, an adventurer traveler. He's got some scrolls sticking out. But yeah, he's got the toy. He's got sausages. He's got <laughs> cheese. You know, it's just, it's fun. Yeah. It's really fun. And yeah, he has a couple pieces that are really fun. The one that I really want to paint is called Quicksilver. It's this girl on a moped. Um mm -hmm. and I think she has something on the back of the moped like sitting on it's there. A little, it's a little robot. I think yeah, it's a little robot. Yeah. And I just love I love that scene. It feels like it feels like something out of a really cool concept that uh I don't know why. It just gives me a certain feeling. Um and I really want to paint that model at some point. I think he actually sent me the STL for that model and I haven't printed it out yet. But that, that model is really cool, and I'd love to, love to give it a shot at some point. Okay. This is cool. This is, this is a, a wonderfully characterful model. Um, it'd be a bit challenging to paint the face because he's holding the pug like right in front of it and stuff. But, yeah, you managed to get in those eyes and get those nice specular highlights and stuff. Yeah. I really like that because he's got – you can tell, like, even in the expression on his face, he's got a stern expression like scolding, but there's also a warmth to it and in how you paint that too. But, like, I like it in the, in the dark side to get that – I still like dark so it'd be in dark but then still getting all that stuff in there and the little specular highlight I was like I'm really proud of that but it's also from an angle <laughs> that's not an exciting angle but like it kind of rewards you as being a three three-dimensional piece of art to, 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 to turn around and then see that that side of it but what uh what color did you use for the white of his eyes out of curiosity that is it's the so tried that. and true uh warm or red gray Red gray. Okay, that's a pretty mid beige uh, brown gray thing, right? It's a it's a warm gray. It's always, <laughs> it's always so interesting to me how you could find that in my signature series set by Procrell. <laughs> this fucking chill. <laughs> uh, it always surprises me how dark you can go with the white of the eye mm -hmm. and still have it feel like a white. You know. Yes. So in in that that is not purely mixed with that color. It's actually that red gray is mixed with that warmer kind of violety purple highlight that's it's from the ambient light so it's even darker so it's a little darker but it, it, it like shows that the reflective nature of your eye will pick up the, some of the colors of the surrounding areas especially mm -hmm. under low light situations so yeah that you can go real dark i like to typically do that where i go darker than i think i should with the eye it can always get brighter but it's like if you go too bright it just looks silly mm. <laughs> so 
I think he nailed it. I think it looks really good. He's, he is a fun little fun little guy uh, to paint. So it's, I had fun. And he's like, oh, it's not perfectly smooth or whatever, but it's more just focusing on trying to create the, the scene with the light and drawing you where you want to go. So you are you are traveling to Monte San Savino as well as prior you're going to uh is it Germany to visit Roland Lapotte. Yeah, and give me a second. I want to read you the message that I got from him a okay. y- a year ago. Okay. So let me find it real quick. On September 21st, uh 2022, um, he sent me this message, uh, and I'll read just a little bit of it. Hey, Scott, hope you're doing fine. Thanks for the laughter I had yesterday with your recent video of the workspaces. Awesome. I made up my mind about things and wanted to let you know. I see you as one of the coolest manager painting dudes on YouTube and also someone who has his heart in the right spot when it comes to passion. I'm happy that you produce so many videos and stuff and such. On the other hand, it saddens me as I see this as taking away tons of pain time when it comes to your progress and knowledge buildup. I see slash feel slash know that you are on the right journey and you want to learn more. The right questions arise and I can see this in your talks and your videos about miniatures, but not in your miniatures thus far. Woof. I want to help you step up your game and help you sort your uh, toolbox and knowledge. Uh, I just sent like six head exploding emojis like, to, that, <laughs> to, that, to that message. Cause like um, there's a lot of emotion built up in, in, in this. And I think I've told the story before, but um, when I was first getting started on YouTube, I had a playlist of videos. There were 10 videos about, and they were like a bunch of beginner t- uh, skills, basing, layering, shit like that. And uh, I, I uh, made a playlist of those things. And my whole strategy for YouTube was, okay, I'm going to make these technique videos, and then I'll refer to them later in my future videos. And I'll make a mm-hmm. playlist, and it'll be a great foundation for my channel. And it turned out it was. It was a great idea. And so I took this playlist, which I had finished it all, and I sent it to like, 10 different blogs and the only person that gave me time of day was roman in massive voodoo and at that point i love massive voodoo i love reading the blog and everything so that was so meaningful to me and the other thing that that is so meaningful to me about roman is that he is able to paint miniatures and just not give a fuck about anyone or anything else and i feel like i really struggle with that like i really carry the weight of expectation not only in the quality level of the paint job, but the quality level of the video and all these things. I feel like a lot of my motivation comes from, I just think people expect these things of me or I expect it of myself. It's like, I have the capability of painting a model really well or making a really awesome video. So why wouldn't I do that all the fucking time? Which is like incredibly exhausting. Yeah. And I feel like for Roman, he's he just knows. He knows like exactly how much joy he gets out of a model and he paints that and he doesn't do any more. And it's just like, fuck, like I just, and it still looks fucking good. And it's just like, yeah. I just, I want to know that and harness that. I think that'd be great for me, like mentally, both in like my life and also in the hobby. That's just one small part of it. So I don't, I don't know what he wants to talk about. We, we, we met, we talked a little bit about like topic and stuff, but it wasn't super concrete. And so, about a year later, a little bit more than a year later, I am now going to this Sunday. Uh, so today is today's Friday. So in two days, mm-hmm. I'm going to fly to Augsburg um, or somewhere in Germany, East Germany, I think Berlin. Um, and then I'm going to go to his house because he's hosting me. And I've got to pay for it. I have to pay for the flight and do this fucking dream scenario where I get to hang out with this dude who has been such an inspiration to me such a charitable force in the hobby, such a, such a wealth of knowledge in the hobby. And, uh, I get to learn from him. Um, it's just, uh, it it feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I'm like trying my hardest to like be in the right mental headspace to absorb it all. Cause like, I'm like stressing about filming a video and like, what's the video going to be about. And it's like, I really don't want my attention to be divided a whole lot, but I also want to capture this moment that feels like it's never going to happen again. You know? Right. Um, Even so, if it would, it wouldn't happen for the first time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a certain bit of magic happening right now, and so like, I'm really conflicted right now about that. It's like, should I make a video at all? Like, I, I have a lot. I have a lot going on right now, so it's like I could not make a video and be totally covered for like topics and shit for like the entirety of November and December. Right. Um. So yeah, and then after we do a two day private coaching, um, we are going to drive through the Swiss Alps with him and an, uh, one of his other. Uh, painter friends 
to Monte San Savino, Savino, the town in Italy, which hosts the event, Monte San Savino, uh, which is a, a miniature painting thing that um, is smaller, um, maybe a little bit more like painter focused uh, than typical cons. Cons have a like a Con has a pretty good split. I would say like maybe like half and half or like 40, mm -hmm. 60 painting gaming. Uh, this is probably more like 90, 10. I mean, I don't know. I've never been. But from what I see on the outside, it seems largely painting focused. But it's smaller. It's a little bit. It's not as big and grandiose as like Nova or, or Adepticon. But the uh, sheer amount of models that are going to be there. Yeah, the display models. No be... no glass. They're all just sitting out on the table to look at. Oh, baby. Uh, a lot of heavyweights there. Just sneeze on them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little concerned about like feeling like a fish out of water because like there's going to be a bunch of like really amazing like you know european uh painters there uh that are just like you know like really yeah. really good and like they're probably you know they probably don't they don't like hate american painters but this is kind of like their special thing right and so it kind of feels like i'm invading a little bit in on their special thing like eric swinson has been adopted by yeah. them yeah, yeah. I, I haven't gone through that adoption phase well yet, you know? you'll have you'll have eric there and he's a great guy to help yeah kind of show you around but and in my somewhat limited experience, so like uh, Christoph Kovalchuk, when he, he was here for Nova and then meeting T-Bolt, um, who's from France, and a number of other guys, you know, and um, like Sergio Calvo and Angel Geraldes, that have met, these guys are huge names, right? Yeah. All these painters. Yeah. Just phenomenal award-winning painters. They're, they're just very happy and welcoming and yeah. i think you will experience that um i think so too and going in there with a bit of uh, you're naturally you're going to go in there with a bit of like you're going to have a humbleness to you just naturally right because you're not going in there big dick swinging like i'm gonna go come fucking win this whole thing whatever it's, it's <laughs> just sheer amount of talent that's in, in that room yeah i think people will feel that energy and that will be you'll be have a a wonderful welcoming experience how cool is that fucking road trip gonna be bro dude it's gonna be fucking awesome oh um, man i told my dad about it and he was like i think the i don't know how he knew this but he's like i think the alps has a forecast to snow during that period and i was just like what like first well, of all you know that? how did you know that and second of all that would suck if that were happening because i think he said it was like to the point where like you shouldn't drive through the alps but uh we'll see what happens um isn't that the place where the plane crashed and the people had to eat each other <laughs> In like the, I've heard of like that the, in like the eighties. I've heard of that, but I don't know the answer. You need to watch that movie on the plane right over there. What's a the fucking movie called? Um, Alive. Alive is the name of the movie. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Watch that on the plane right over there. I'm sure it will be fine. <laughs> um, yeah. So man, that's gonna be so. That is gonna be so cool. And the thing of the food you're gonna have. I know, dude. I'm excited. I'm excited to. I want to go out late at night in Augsburg, Germany, and just like film some like nighttime german videography and like maybe get like some fucking nighttime snacks i don't know if they have that but in uh just sausages like, so and pretzels you know and beer uh it's a lot of sauerkraut yeah <laughs> or th th that too uh i don't know if i'm being racist right now but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you are for okay. sure. okay. uh we, we were we were in um amsterdam and man the nightlife there with the food in particular like like the fucking sweets and pastries is on point and there's a there's a reason why that may be the case I'm not sure if they share that reason with Germany, but I'm curious if it's going to have like a little mm. little nighttime snacky scene. My my thought, this is how I would approach it in terms, but you 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 will find your own way mm. in terms of a video for this. Go in with no expectations and no understanding what you want it to be. Take have a camera accessible that it's not taking your focus and your attention, namely like stuff for like B-roll. Well, maybe there's a microphone um you know, a shotgun mic attached to the to the camera or something. So you have captured something, and then by the end of your your trip, the story will have presented itself, and you will have enough to then pull that story together because you'll be able to patch and fill in the holes when you're back here. That's risky, bro. I know it's risky, but it's the least it's the least intrusive yeah. for the being present in the experience. I think that's yeah. more important is that you're present in the experience. But I also would hate for you to have this amazing idea or this wonderful thing that's just like, oh my gosh, it kind of writes itself. It's just kind of there that you just kind of feel like now I can't do it. Um, 
because it can easily be a thing where the video is the inspiration for what today's video is, is on this story. And the thing you're talking about, maybe while you're painting, while you're building, while you're doing something else, and the B-roll flipped in is from the trip. So it's kind of you've done all that pre-work and that's the kind of inspiration what you're doing. So you don't have, you don't rely 100 percent on all, everything you capture there to make the whole thing. Right. Yeah. That that is what I would do. We make videos differently, though. So. Sure, yeah. And you kind of touched on, so I had this same conversation uh, with my business coach um, yesterday, and he, he had this idea, which I, I really resonated with, was like, maybe the video should just be about like the degree of which I need or like I operate with expectation in mind. Mm. And it's like, so you, you just said the phrase, going with no expectation. And I think the video could be about about expectation and how how it colors everything we do in life and like how i am trying to let go and seeing what happens when i let go mm. um so that's a little bit more philosophical a little more wishy-washy maybe there'll be some concrete things that come out of that experience but that's the current idea right now yeah i like that idea um, a lot which is a little amorphous right so i can yeah. like shoot a, a bunch of shit and, and and work it in it doesn't need to have specific things i'm not like getting an interview with roman or some shit like that yeah i don't think that i think if naturally there was like he says something profound and you had the camera rolling like you you have that yeah and it's yeah. natural yeah yeah you know and i mean yeah i mean you always do the the slow-mo shot of him like rinsing out his brush <laughs> or whatever right, yeah. while you're 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 oh, philosophizing a... over the top there's gotta be a <laughs> lot of slow-mo shots brother it's gonna be a lot of handheld a lot of slow-mo like little motions yeah yeah so okay I'm sure everyone will speaking of sausage everyone wants to know how the sausage is made but uh, i think i'll let you know yeah you know, that is something we found ourselves in. I actively didn't even take a camera to Nova this year as I want to have an unabashed experience to really know, feel concrete in my thoughts about it as an event without being distracted of making a video. And I thought that that helped me a lot. But that also is a different kind of experience than what you're doing here where this truly is a kind of a once in a lifetime thing, even if it becomes a regular thing for you, it's kind of a catalyst moment. Yeah. So there, it, it's a thing like, you know, people, it's the question we get a lot is like, Oh, you, uh, while you're at something, it's like, Oh, you're making a video here or what are you you're doing a video on this or whatever. And it's just like, kind of like, let me be a human too, please. <laughs> like, and, and it, but also it's don't feel bad about asking that question because we ask ourselves that question a million times. Everything, <laughs> everything. everything. Yeah. yeah. I, I was re so Seth Everman, a huge YouTuber, is quitting YouTube. And, and one of the reasons he's doing it is because he was like, when I did anything in life, when I traveled, when I experienced anything that was even slightly related to my video, the question is always, sorry, my channel, the question was always, do I make a video about this? Do I, do I bring a camera with me? Um, and like that, it like fucking never goes away. And it's like every idea I have for the hobby is like, oh, that should be a video idea. And it's just like, it, it, it really makes you think about things in a certain way and experience things in a certain way. And yeah, having having moments where you can just like chill and do the thing and experience it for yourself yeah. is like is important for sure. And finding a way to and I think you've been doing this. Um, you've done it with like your Age of Sigmar army. You've done it with your uh, Song of Ice and Fire stuff is folding in the things that excite you. Yeah, dude. Personally into your videos is it's so healthy and you feel like you feel like you've got two birds with one stone in a way definitely and it, it's always the question the only was like why don't why isn't that the obvious that's what you always do well that's not the way the youtube algorithm works unfortunately and you kind of feel like you're making uh you know you're you're compromising in order to do that but i think it's a healthy healthy compromise it's know? hard though dude it's hard like when i made that star wars video and it did poorly that really like kind of killed me because i was like damn like this feels so similar to everything that i do why is this sucking so much dick and so i, I had kind of a come to jesus moment and i what that what the result of that moment was was i was like okay i, I have to think about like youtube in a, in a in a different way like when i first got into youtube i did a lot of research about what the audience wants what what mini painting on youtube looks like but that was fucking eight years ago and I haven't done any of that thinking 
ever. And so I'm operating with old knowledge, pieced together knowledge, which is why my videos are so hit or miss. It's like, I'll put a video out, it'll get 120K views in a month. I'll put a video out, it'll get 40K views in a month. And I'm like, and I'm sitting there like, what the fuck am I doing wrong? And so I, I need to, I need to figure it out because I feel like, and I won't talk a whole lot more about this. I feel like YouTube has this promise to creators where it's like, you can make a video about anything you want and it will do well if you know what you're fucking doing. If you, if you've figured out how to make amazing videos, it will work. But like that amount of knowledge is so, so hard to, to, to understand and come by. And you only come to it through like years of failure and so much struggle. And it's like, if that promise didn't exist, if the CEO of YouTube came to me and he was like, Scott, we've written in the code that you will only ever get 100K views if your paintbrush touches a GW model. It's literally programmed in. It has nothing to do with people. That's just how the system works. I'd quit today mm. because like I, I can't, that, that just not, it's not the promise that I feel like YouTube is giving every creator where it's like, do whatever you want, you'll find success if you're good at making videos. Like that's, that's, the, that's the caveat, right? And so it's a, it's a high bar um, and I'm slowly f trying to figure it out and I don't know, but I want to believe that's possible. I want to believe I can paint anything and get 100K, 200K views, but uh, I have to prove that to myself first. Uh, so we'll see. See, the, the key is you don't actually have to paint a Games Workshop model. You just have to say the term Games Workshop in the title. <laughs> so I, I don't want to talk about this more, but I kind of want to talk about it more because I've been thinking about it a lot. But uh, you, you're touching on something that's very important, and that's bridging the gap from your target audience to what your subject is. And a huge thing is like, you know, we paint models, and both of our target audiences are pretty similar. Mm -hmm. They're people who enjoy watching painting videos of GW products, like to be very specific. And so when you can kind of bridge that gap, and kind of like earn that emotional investment like right away, either with a title, thumbnail, first 15 seconds, then you've captured that viewer and then you're gonna get you're gonna get views. I think at a baseline, that's like great advice, but like how you execute on that is yeah. different every single time. Yeah. And how you keep it fresh and different. Yeah. Because it can quickly be a spiral of like he just keeps doing the same thing. Yeah, dude. With, yeah. With the title and thumbnail, especially. Right. Yeah. You know? And it's like yeah, it's it's a it's a whole nother can of worms to walk that line and also be true to the people that have been loyal to you and watch your videos and like you for you and like the stuff you do for the stuff you do. And those are the most important people. Yeah. You know, yeah. I want to stay true to them because they like the things that I do that I like to do. So I want to give them that. So, yeah. But, but you nailed it. You painted a obscure 3D printed display model in a hard directional light and and it got a it's at 120k views after seven days six days and you did that because uh the title and and the subject matter of the first couple minutes of the video I, I did watch that part was was grabbing that audience that cares you you contextualized the subject for them and then they were in Mm -hmm. And it shows. And that honestly, that's my guess. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all a guess. We I, don't mm, fucking know. Yeah, but like, I, I think that's how it's supposed to work. Um, but like, this this is this is different than YouTube. This is this is not YouTube anymore. This is this is just like, this is. I feel like a magazine editor. I feel like a fucking newspaper editor. I feel like, like this is these are just good things to do when making content for anybody. Is is thinking about these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like it the what's the front page headline, right? It's going to be like the 1960s Superman Metropolis Daily News, right? It's yeah. the same kind of thing. It's like what's the picture on the front page? What's the title? That's what they always talk about. And right. it has been since the beginning of media as we know it. But it depends also like what city you're in. Like yes. if you're in fucking Louisiana, they're going to care about a certain subject matter compared hurricanes. to New York City, right? <laughs> yeah. Or that, yeah. So yeah. Well, that's that's it. They they care about the hurricane news in Louisiana. Sure. They don't care about it in New York. Exactly. Exactly. You know, after the hurricane came and like you know X number of people died in the cities in ruins or blah blah blah, then that then they care in New York because it's um, after the <laughs> it's dramatic, right? Sure. Yeah. It's, yes. It's, it's it's crazy and it's dramatic, and people are drawn to that. And this again, this all goes back, and I'm, I'm a broken record on this, but it goes back to uh, the human psychology and how we perk up and we pay attention to things and certain things we don't. Yeah. Because my daily life, I go through and do all the things that I need to do, 
the things that I want to do, the things that I have to do, the things that I don't want to do, but I know are important for me to do my daily life. Therefore, the things that I have mental space for, and this the amount of mental space can vary person to person, but it is a it is a universal fact that the things that I perk up to and I pay attention to are the things that jump out as dramatic and important to me, even if I didn't think they were. So that means if I'm going to catch your attention, I have to catch your attention and make it worth your time. Yeah. And me saying in a video title, um, how to layer. That's true to what the, the video is about. That's really important in miniature painting. I could learn a shitload in that. That does not do enough to grab somebody and say, I must watch this. This will teach me a lot. This is very important to me. That's not to say that that video will be, you know, you'll get no views, but in comparison to that same video, instead of being titled how to layer, it's the, it could be titled the, the most important thing you'll ever learn about painting Warhammer. It's the same video, but I have made it unavoidable for you to feel that you need to click on that and watch that. And that is the pro the mental process that every mini painting YouTuber that you watch or you enjoy has to go through every time they do something because they've done the extensive amount of work to make the video, whether you watch it or not. And so it's that constant ebb and flow or pull and push on how do you stay true to what the video is about? But how do you make it scream and flashing lights that they feel like they, they need to click? Yeah. And then you have to follow through and actually have that good video. But honestly, that part is not the scary part. The actually making an awesome video, at least to me, and I think to you, your quality of your work shows it. Thank you. Is not That's not the struggle. That is not the hard part. Because that's also the fun part. That's the part we're willing to sit there and rework and, and edit or or find the correct timing. How much of this clip of the pause do I cut? Do I leave for comedic value? Yeah. Where do I? Yeah, all those little things that you. How do. long is the transition? Like yes. sound effects, all these. Yeah, yeah all of the. Yeah, all of that is. But that's when you see it come together. It's like, oh gosh, now that scene. It, it's just it. It works now. Yeah, that's. If you don't have that, you're not gonna you're not gonna do this long term anyway because you ha you got to get a certain amount of joy out of that yeah. to keep doing the work. Yeah. But it is not fun trying to come up with silly thumbnails and wackadoo na titles. Yeah. At least not for me. It's well, there, I think it goes more as well. Like, because if you don't, obviously there's there's the low hanging fruit of painting a GW thing that that kind of always works, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But like, if I were to do that Star Wars video again, it wouldn't be in the thumbnail. It wouldn't be in the title. It wouldn't be in the first thirty seconds of the video. I wouldn't talk about fucking Star Wars at all. It would just be like a. It's almost like you gotta trick people into like watching things, and they kind of realize like, oh, this this applies to me. Okay, and now we're painting Star Wars. It's like, okay, well, I'm already like invested. Then I don't, I don't really care. But it's like he's gotta. He's gotta frame it. You gotta contextualize it in a way that that earns their interest. And like, if you immediately start with a thing where they're like. I don't care about that thing. They're immediately tuned out before you even say yep. anything, right? You just lost that person. And that's that's kind of what I was getting to with the whole newspaper. It's like if if Alabama has an article called like titled not not to be like whatever, but like, you know, like uh some kind of like liberal thing. Like a liberal meetup <laughs> as a newspaper article. Like how many views and clicks and impressions in a newspaper sense is that gonna get? It's not gonna get a lot because you're not thinking about the people and what they care about in your in your area, in our case, in our subscription base. Um, so it's, it's important to think about that in a huge way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, you're right. But also the other thing is that the structure of the video also needs to support the title and the thumbnail as yes. well. Uh, which is, which, so that's not like, that, that isn't like technique, like editing and transitions and shit like that. And like audio levels and stuff, but that, that, that does change how you format the video and what order you present information and all this shit. Anyways, I think so. It's so important to to just make the video you want to make first and then you have you you know what it is and so then you can feel more confident in the way that you want to present it because yeah but you know what the thing is i've done that and it's failed so many times so i feel like i gotta 
I need to think about it before I really start to establish what the order of events is in the video. Mm. So I, think I like really I had that April man where I painted four display models in a row and or three sorry three and then that sci-fi that small sci-fi diorama, and every single one of those videos sucked ass for performance. And I've painted display models before, and it's gotten a lot of views. So I, I, I and then I had other things that didn't do super well. So. There's something I'm not understanding, and I'm trying to figure it out. But I'm I'm encouraged at the moment to really try to think about it, and figure it out, and see if anything happens. Maybe, maybe nothing will come of it, um, but uh, at the very least, the 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 hamster in the wheel is is running at max rip right now. Yeah. I mean, it's all American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> what it is is it's all American Ninja Warrior course, but if you decide to do a video on Painting a display model, the American Ninja Warrior course is not the same course as you're going to have to run if you are painting a Space Marine. Yeah. They're both an American Ninja Warrior course, and you still got to go through the right, the right sessions or the right parts of the course correctly. But you admit you, it, and it's totally achievable to still be successful on that harder course. But you just have to understand going into it that I, you, you really got to nail some part of it really well in order to get them get them in yeah it's it's uh it is the whole thing and this episode has just turned into the kind of conversation scott and i usually have over eating chicken tendies over lunch this is the main topic man. <laughs> yeah this is just us talking about w like the interesting well it's interesting to us we don't know what you guys but like this is this is uh this is the part of the going from uh Visiting Rome in the Pot and Monte Sansovino or to <laughs> what video you're gonna make there. Right, to... so like what's that gonna be called? Like what's that video gonna be called? You know, how how do I how do I make that experience interesting to someone who doesn't give a shit, who doesn't know who Rome in the Pot is, doesn't give a shit about display painting, doesn't give a you know, whatever, any of that stuff, you know? It's like that's a thing I have to think about. Um, cause uh the last time I made a video about Rome in the Pot, I called it the YouTube bubble and I like have a very artsy name and a very artsy thumbnail, and that video also did terribly. Yeah. Um, so I got to think about that. You know, it's an, it's an important thing to do. Yeah, it is. Okay. We are going to actually have a real topic today, but it's probably not going to be a real long one, but we think it's a fun one, yeah, an interesting yeah. one, uh, because we've already talked so long. Hour 18. Dude, we're getting good at this talking a long time thing. <laughs> okay. A little too good, actually. So, yeah, for our own good. Um, interesting thing about this. So I listened to a... Uh, video games podcast it's a uh, kind of like a general video games podcast called grinding gear the grinding gear podcast um and these two guys they've been playing blizzard games together for years they're they're big uh heroes of the storm players they're hearthstone players they were what's the other one um Workout. overwatch overwatch yeah um they both played wow way back when People played WoW, <laughs> and uh, now they're into Final Fantasy fourteen. But anyway, neither here nor there. So one lived in Florida, one lived in Washington State. Literal opposite parts of the country. Um, their YouTube channel, their streaming, and their podcasts are now doing well enough to where their uh, Garrett and Kyle are now uh, moving to the same state. And they both have spouses. Um, Garrett has a child, and his wife's pregnant with a second child. No, Kyle. Anyway, either way. So they're... the guy from Washington's moving to Florida and they just recorded their first podcast in person. Typically their podcasts are right about an hour each episode. It's one podcast a week. Their very first one was almost two and a half hours because they were in person and that they don't, I don't think they even mentioned it in the episode that it's not a topic of discussion at all. I noticed it immediately because I'm like, ah, you motherfuckers see what it's like when you're in person. It just goes <laughs> So much more like off the rails or it, tangents or you just talk because you're just talking instead of this this virtual kind of barrier that yeah. keeps things closer. I think if it's easier to like interrupt someone while they're speaking or find that moment where like they've completed a thought and now you can go before they can they can they start their next one. That's when you get the the tangents, right? Yes. It's yes. like you said something that sparked a memory. Let me jump in here. And that's a lot harder to do when yes. you're like in Discord, you know? Yeah, because that gap in time, because of the slight delay, that gap in time, half the time at least, 
they are starting talking again when you do that jump in. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. don't have the physical cues. You don't have the immediate audio feedback. Mm -hmm. And it's just the talk over. You do the talk over a couple of times and then you're gun shy and then you don't want to talk over yeah, and then yeah. you never interject. And it, it's just a. There's probably a skill to it. Like, there's probably, if you did it a lot, you probably get, like, better at it. But I feel like there'd always be some amount of, like, latency and, like, the, yeah. uh, can I go? Uh, I don't know. It certainly is a skill. And I've seen people that are, that podcast that really do it well. But it's, like, it's evolved over doing it a lot of times in kind of understanding the ebbs and flows. Can, can our podcast pop off so, like, I can just, like, fuck around with my YouTube channel and not care about performance? Yeah. We need a content strategist for, for our podcast. Like, yep. we need someone who's, like, who's amazing at social media and also tapped into the hobby and they'll be like, this is what you got to do to make amazing podcasts. And I'd be like, okay, fuck yeah. I just want someone whose job it is to tell me that, please. And we need G Fuel to sponsor us. <laughs> yes, please. Dude, because G Fuel sponsors all sorts of streamers and shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm drinking G Fuel today, so they get in on their radar. <laughs> so you just need a bunch of sponsors. <laughs> and then, then we can do that. Okay. All right. All Problem right. solved. Easy. Today's topic is brought to us by Scuba Steve. Scuba Steve. What is that topic? Okay, we, we he wants us to rehash the topic of professional miniature painters. So we must have talked about this before, but I don't remember. Yeah, it might be, uh, we may have done it in passing or as part of another topic. That's where my my spiderweb filled brain is going with I'm this. mostly blackout whenever we record that. Yes, it's gone from my brain until I listen to it later. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read his entire question. And oh, then really? we'll just we'll just kind of go with it because it's, it's a bit of a long one. Rehash on the topic of professional miniature painters. At what point would you guys consider someone a professional painters? What criteria would someone have to meet to slap on the title to do that? For some context, having a profession in something requires prolonged training and formal qualifications. What, if any of those things, would get you that title? Could it be based on placing in formal competitions? Or maybe it's just being paid to paint miniatures. We'd love to hear you guys ramble on this topic. So, professional miniatures painters. Hmm. So I did a little, uh, uh, what you call a uh, Webster's Dictionary definition research. Hmm, okay. Um, and Let's start. Professional, there's adjectives and there's noun versions. So there's the two main um, noun uh, definitions. And they're separate. The first one being, and I don't think they're in any particular order, but there are two. And the first one is um, having a certification or professional uh, training, such as a lawyer or a doctor. That's like the end of the definition. Having professional training. Yeah. So in this case, like going to law school or. Yeah. And I, maybe it's better that I actually look this up and read it, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. And the second one was. Um, Doing a task is your main form of income as opposed to uh, uh, as a hobby. They didn't use the word hobby, but it was kind of synonym for hobby. It's pastime. I think they used pastime. Okay. Um, so, and that was it. Also one sentence definition. That, that has been my classical understanding of whatever profession is, whether you're a professional video game player or a professional hobbyist is uh, that you do it for a living. Yeah. And so let's, I think that's the low hanging fruit and we can it is, discuss yeah. that in more in depth because I think that there is some depth there, but we can go back to the first one because there is no certification, professional certification for or being a professional miniature painter, but there are kind of things they are almost like a checkbox of things mm. that they're not explicitly def uh, you 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 do them and then it makes you that and then you can put it on a business card, but they imply that. Okay, you're saying like you, the ability to accomplish certain techniques. Is that I, what you're saying? No, it's not even techniques. Okay, it's by checking the box that you do these things. Let me give you an example. All right, do you teach miniature painting at a convention? Sometimes. Okay, if you teach miniature painting at a convention, we assume. That makes you a professional mm -hmm. because you are teaching someone. You are charging money. We're getting the money thing in here, but it's different than the second form of the definition. That you have a level of expertise worthy of some group of people paying for you to teach them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one. Okay. Number two, you do box arts. Mm-hmm. 
you paint box arts for the official paint job of a miniature. Okay. Okay. How many of these items are there? I I don't know. This is all off the top of my head. Oh, okay. so I don't okay, I don't okay. know how many. But that's that's another one. Okay. That that one to me um I think we're going to we're going to answer this question colored by our own like uh, opinions because yeah. like there are certain things that you're probably going to value in a painter like more or differently from me and for some reason that last one is like the not most important but that's the one that like would be the the best signal to me that someone is a pro if like a display model company that i recognize and know um has hired someone to paint one of their newest figures for mm -hmm. box art like that's like okay You've kind of you you've kind of made it in the pro mini painting scene because you are being paid to paint, and you're being paid by one of these niche brands that don't have a lot of options, um, and they picked you. Um, or sorry, they don't make a lot of models. Um, so yeah, that that feels like a a pretty a pretty good indicator to me. Or maybe you're just you came in at the right price point too. Yeah, you know you're cheaper. There's a lot of caveats to all of these. You know, yeah. like. I mean, just because you run a class at a convention does not mean that you know what you're fucking talking about <laughs> or uh, that you know how to teach people in general. You know, like there's a lot of like, you know, what ifs. Yeah, we do have a caveat here. We were talking about caveats and not putting caveats in your YouTube videos, but we're going to put it. <laughs> we're going to put a caveat. Oh, podcasts are OK for like podcast, extended you know, yes. discussion. Great caveat that this is our opinion and there <laughs> may be a little bit of spiciness in our opinions on this. At least I feel like it's I feel it bubbling in mine right now. <laughs> You're bubbling, bro. I'm bubbling. <laughs> And teaching painting at, uh, at a convention or an event or whatever is one of them for me. Yeah. Um, like maybe he's got a hookup with the convention coordinator, right? Yeah. I mean, there's that. There's the there are people that go out of their way to consistently ask to determine who is the person that schedules those things and they bug them and bug them and yeah. bug them. Yeah. Yeah. And to get themselves in there. Um, what, before I forget it, though, there's another one I just thought of. Okay, you've won. You've placed at a reputable painting competition, or maybe any painting competition, or maybe there's just a, a elitist tier of painting competitions that yeah. you've placed at. Um, that or you've placed consistently at. I don't know. Again, a thrill about what that means. But that if you've done so well, if you've performed so well. That that means you're a professional, hmm. um, and it oftentimes it felt like it like when I was new to the hobby and would go to Adepticon and see who the the, the teachers were and looking at which classes we were going to take and stuff. Those kind of went hand in hand. Hmm. It felt like the people that maybe it was just because I was less knowledgeable back then, but it felt like the people that were teaching were all people. I could I could link to their successes in in competitions with previous pieces. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Um, Especially early on at Depticon, a lot of the painter display paint people are all people that just competed in Crystal Brush. That yeah. that that's really what it was entirely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And now like Adepticon, Nova, um Gen Con, ReaperCon, I'm just t talking about American ones cuz I know them more. It, it feels like that contingent of people that are teaching there don't necessarily have that those boxes checked. Yeah. And it's still some of them, but it's, it's, yes. de it's definitely less, though. It's, def it's, it's not as much. Maybe it's because there's more classes offered now. Maybe because the hobby is bigger. And maybe this person that's teaching here is maybe they haven't won a, a crystal brush or a, a golden demon or whatever, but they have a, a sound understanding and a way of teaching for new painters so yeah their skill level doesn't need super high there's also more info available now for people to learn and then become capable of teaching without without competing and going through that process you know yeah so all of that to say and this is not throwing shade on any particular person and if you teach at a miniature painting competition whether it's local or it's a big one and you don't have that i have not been paid to do box arts i haven't won anything this is not me saying you shouldn't teach don't don't misunderstand that. What I'm trying to get at, though, is chart tied to determine if that factor should come into play in the determination is if someone is a professional. And I say no. 
if you teach miniature painting, that does not make you a professional miniature painter because there is a strong list of people that do that that I would not categorize as professional miniature painter. Okay. I have a question for you. If you could go to the University of Miniature Painting, it's probably pretty easy to think about what classes you could take. Yeah. But what would the available majors be at the University of Mini Painting? I think if you'd look at like art colleges um, and to look at what can you get a degree in in an art college, it's probably a good comparison there. Sure. And oftentimes those are in, in – in, Correct me if I'm wrong for people in the comments that understand this better, but you have an art degree with a specialty in X. So it's considered a well-rounded degree, but this is your area of focus. And it could be sculpting. It could be painting. It could be illustration. Okay. It could be graphic design. Well, how about the hobby world? What would it be? It would. I think there's just the one. What's the one? <laughs> Miniature painting. Oh, really? Okay, that's it. I think that it's a little bit different. I think that you can have a focus in army painting. I think you can have a focus in speed painting individual figs. I think you can have a focus in display painting. I think you can have a focus in sculpting models. Uh, yeah, I guess like sculpting is is, is very different. different. But I, I truly think that at the very least, the skills required to paint an army are vastly different than the skills required to paint a display model. Okay, riddle me this then. If I am an amazing army painter, I could I could teach, write the rule book, teach the classes as an amazing army painter. Does that mean I can find success as the highest level display painter that competes? And the opposite. If I am M Michael Pasarsky, can I then also make army, paint an army as as good in the same amount of time as somebody else oh no absolutely not no no I'm not, way i'm not saying the same day i'm saying given enough time to learn that one of those things is absolutely true michael pisarski ben Kometz, they they're so good at a thing that is so very difficult yes that if they put their attention in that I have no doubt they, with their understanding of art and what makes it work, what's important, what to paint, what to emphasize, what not to emphasize, their use of color, their use of light. But to do that at a speed level, this is a broad generalization. But I think that they absolutely could be a master of army painting. I do not believe that everyone that's really good at army painting can do what they can do at a display level. Given, I, given enough time. Given enough Given, given a reasonable amount of time. Let's say one year. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe. So the reason why I asked that question, because what, what I wanted to uh, ask you, which we can get into this later or, or not at all, was just like how many proficiencies sure. must a person have to be professional, you know? But to, to answer the question that you just posed, um, you posed another interesting question, which is like at the highest level, who makes more money? Someone who's really good at army painting? Someone who's really good at display painting. And I I don't know. There are people know. who paint whole armies and probably make a fuckload of money doing that. Like there's one person that I'm thinking of right now who makes these amazing display model boards. He used to have a booth at Adepticon. Mm -hmm. I've heard him finger painting models, but like they look so good I don't understand that. It's like that guy probably has a very specific clientele list who is willing to pay maybe five figures, clearly five figures for that kind of job. And if you can pump that out once every two months, like he's making three figures a year, you know? And it's like, is this a display model painter making that much? Like, I don't know, but this is all napkin math right now. But yeah. like, so I don't, I don't know if it's a, it's a super easy comparison for the money earned, but to answer your second question, which was given a year, I think it depends on the person. Yes. For me yes. specifically, like when I started to really get into mini painting, sorry, army painting, I started to realize all these deficiencies that I had and maybe it's because I'm just in my head so much and like thinking about like, Oh, what am I doing wrong? Like all the time. Um, but it, it feels like it's a, it's a huge skill and I feel it feels like I'm kind of bad at it. 
Um, and I'm like still learning or relearning really how to paint an army. Cause I, that's where I started in the hobby was painting armies and then kind of went away from it. And now I'm kind of coming back to it Yeah. and I feel like I suck at it. So, um, yeah, it's a different, you're, you're utilizing different techniques and in different ways. So I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question, but, but, but you think that you think that Michael Pasarski could figure out how to paint an army in a year as well as that person. But the person who can't paint the uh, army that well, couldn't figure out how to do what Michael Pasarski does in a year. Yeah. I, my yeah to to make it a little bit probably more palatable if you had the hundred best display painters in the world and the hundred best army painters in the world and you all gave them the task of one year to be as best as you possibly can as the other group yeah i would i would bet a lot of money on the fact that the people that are the display painters more of them would check whatever your box of persons proficiency level would be of that 100 would check the box from the army painter group than the other way around Okay. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I think that under the, the high level of understanding that's needed for the display translates so much better than the other way around. I think there's so much level of learning that you can be an awesome, um, army painter that like you still have so many things to get to that. Uh, not even like as good as land, but like to get to how good land was 10 years ago, yeah. you know, which was still like crazy, it's still <laughs> mind blowing. Yeah. It's like, I remember the first time he put out that barbarian NMM and I saw that paint job and I was just like, is that NMM? Is that, I actually don't know. And it, it was, it was mind blowing like that many years ago. And then you've got fucking, fucking big Russian bear coming out with this like hyper realistic, photorealistic NMM. And now it's just like insane. Yeah. You, might, you might be right. I, I don't, I don't know the answer to the question, but you, you could be right. Maybe display it, painting is a better foundation of skills for that future to come. Yeah. And I also think of most of us, those listening and us as well here, um, we, we do a bit of both. Yeah. I think well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there are some people that just do one. You see that most specifically in like the, these display painters, like, that. Oh, that's a question. I think there are definitely more army painters than there are display painters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that typically, if people are really committed to doing display painting, I don't see Instagram posts about their new uh, army, <laughs> army, you know, new army forty k or whatever. Every yeah. once in a while, you Every do. Once in a while, you well, they're painting like one model at a time. Hey, you know, I, and like I, that doesn't work. That doesn't. That doesn't. That doesn't cut it. I see Sergio Calvo post yeah, post, oh post pictures of all these boxes of shit for his next army, but I ain't never seen any of that shit painted. Brother painted. He bought so many Necrons, dude. Yeah. He had like twenty boxes. That's not the first time he's done that either. No, I it never, isn't. And I've never seen the the final army on the, the last Sergio, one. Sergio, brother, ago. what does your backlog look like? Yeah, dude, that's one purchase. Throw Holy down the gauntlet, bud. Let's see them Necrons painted. Let's see that army, brother. <laughs> it's gonna uh, take you three months just to build that shit. Yeah, no fucking shit. Uh, Way longer than to paint Necrons. Okay. So we can come to the conclusion that because there is no official certification or or title, you know, it's not like you're it'd be sweet if like you could get Esquire. Like if, if you were like Scott Walter Esquire. That that Esquire. What is an Esquire? Esquire is a lawyer term. Um it means it, it's a certain certification as a lawyer, and then you can you have that like title okay so how fucking sweet with that okay the only time i've ever heard the word esquire used and i'm sure you know it's from magazine oh no uh fucking bill and ted's excellent adventure oh no i wasn't thinking of it from the uh i've spent so long since i've seen that movie that recent um somewhat recent now uh denzel washington movie where he plays a lawyer um and he's esquire Mm, okay. Yeah, so I, I the abbreviation is ESQ, period. Too. Yes, sweet. yes. So that's what we need to do. We need to start, like, this, <laughs> this shoddy for-profit online college where no, you, we, 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 you get you end with a certification in miniature painting, and then we just make up a random title, and then you can put that. It's an official title you can put on shit. No, we d we don't need to do anything more. Okay, because there's other people that do a painting <laughs> academy. Is that they, they? Whoops, I forgot that that's an actual thing you yeah, can yeah. do. <laughs> but also, we still got to do our magazine. <laughs> we still right, gotta, yeah. gotta, we gotta, we gotta, all these shit. other things. TV we show. We got to run a con, a TV show. Yeah. Got so many things we need to do. So many things. Um. Okay, so there's that. So there, there is no official certification. So, but that doesn't, I it due to the other definition of of being a professional, that doesn't exclude anyone miniature painting from being able to call themselves a professional, just because there's no official certification. Now there is a school of hard knocks, which pretty much that's what all of us have to go through in miniature painting because there is no official education uh, like staircase that you've got to go up. It is all figuring it out, absorbing, committing time, 
prioritizing, learning from a variety of people, and execution and repetition and in an order to get there. So we all have the ability to do that education. That's why we're making YouTube videos. That's why that you can join people's Patreons to, to get feedback. There's all these things. They're kind of your way of progressing. Not that everyone wants to be a professional, but like you're progressing that same line that someone that did want to be a professional. You're working your way up the same ladder at your own pace. All right, I got a question for you. Yeah. So obviously the definition of you need to make a living off of this video professional is is one, but let's get more quantitative. How much money annually after taxes do you need to make to be a professional? Because that there are some people that can live on ramen in a duplex. Does that make you a professional? If like with my career, uh, not mine specifically, but someone else's career, they can pay for a mortgage and support a family. Is that the same level of professional? So how much cash oh, okay. in USD? USD. Annually post-tax. So to me, the big thing is uh, where there's the biggest word that needs to be um, highlighted, underlined, and in all caps in this sentence is your primary source of income. Right. So, so that means this is this isn't like, oh, I'm a professional miniature painter and I also work at Target for it. Oh, no. Yeah. No, none of, none, of none of that shit. None of that shit. This is this is what you do to but pay all you your bills. Like, what would you would you count like T-shirts? If you had like a sick logo and you're selling T-shirts and you made like 100 percent. OK, because that is that is your all brand. Okay. That is your brand. And that that, go, that goes into it. Yes. OK. That How much all money? everything that's that falls under that umbrella. That all counts. OK. Well, the big to me, yes, you touched on one thing is your life. What are the expenses in your life? Yes, I wanted to say equal the playing field. Uh, you know? Oh, well, well, those are more. There's a bigger factor in this that we probably need to discuss, and that is geographic location. Right. And that's another thing It's like it's it's cheaper to live maybe in Poland than it is like maybe in Spain or like whatever it is. But if we, if we just equal the playing field to a dollar amount, then everyone has to play at the same level. Right. And I think that that number should be something that if you worked at McDonald's, it would be like the same amount of money. You think so? Yes. I think it should be that if, if, if you can live without government assistance um, at that job, working a full-time job. Okay. Okay. So that's your level. Okay. That's my level. Okay. Okay. So, so the thing is that minimum wage then, right? Yeah, but that's different for everywhere. I guess so, but you're, so you're saying is the amount of money you need to live where you are at. That's different everywhere, right? Yeah, that's different. So we're just trying to, we, we could say here's a dollar amount and then that could change to their currency, but in their country, it maybe could be a lot more. I mean, it could be, yeah. So like right. if I say like 50 grand, for instance, maybe that's like way more money than you need to live somewhere else. Um, I, th I think, yeah, and I think there are existing professional miniature painters if we want to put people in that category that make less than that and that are professional oh absolutely and they probably yeah make enough to live but yeah i'm gonna say i'm gonna say 50 grand post taxes that makes you professional for, for the paid for metric of the term let me see, let me see because i know this is my first <laughs> my, just, my first job out of college just throwing shit across the bow here uh uh at goody pps is done don't, don't read my, too much into this my first job out of college granted this was a, a good number of years ago only 20 years ago but I think <laughs> only 20 years ago, thirty one thousand two hundred dollars. That's how much I made right out of college as a four year degree. <laughs> thirty one thousand two hundred dollars. That is fifteen dollars an hour. How did you pull that up so fast? You just take you take the hourly rate times. Oh, 20, okay. 20, 80. That's how many hours if you work 40 hours a week. Gotcha. That's how many hours you work in a year. Yep. yep, yep. Um, so that amount. That's uh, that's that, that's pre-tax. That's pre-tax. Yeah. So the, the, it's like. 20% lower than that. You're, I mean, with that amount, um, you're not buying a house. <laughs> oh, no. You're not. You, you you can't afford kids, probably. No, probably not. I mean, unless you have your spouse also as a, as a job and yeah. whatever. Like, we're getting into the economics here. That's probably not necessarily. But, yeah, I mean, the, the issue is, is like, you can do that and, and be a professional. But if circumstances changes in your life where you're not living in an apartment with a roommate anymore and you have a, uh, a significant other and you want to or you have move. health problems you need health insurance yeah, in america brother Good fucking luck dude i pay monthly for health insurance and it just went up 
four ninety a month, and that gives me a, a deductible of seven grand. Mm-hmm. So what that means for people out there that are not blessed by American healthcare is that I need to pay out of pocket for medical procedures that aren't just checkups, annual checkups, $7,000 in procedures before my insurance will start covering anything. That's what you're, that's a premium, right? Yeah. Yes. And you get the lovely benefit of also paying almost $500 a month on top of that. Yep. That, that doesn't yep. count towards the 7000 Nope. It's a it's highway fucking robbery. Yes. Um, oh, I, man, if I had the option to get that rate that you have there, I'd take it in a heartbeat yeah, because yeah. they would they'd laugh at me if I asked for that because if he had to pay for insurance. Pre-existing condition, baby. Yeah, it would be way more. Yeah, they can look at everything that you have afflicted with you and they everything, the price keeps going up. Right. And up. And up. Um, but anyway, that's, that is a very good point. If you need health insurance, if you have a kid, if you want to buy a house, if you want to get married, if you want to have pets, if you want to move out of a sketchy neighborhood, blah, 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 blah. Now that $15 an hour that you, that would categorize you as professional probably cause you to quit that job and get a job that pays more. And you're no longer a professional miniature painter because you're, you, you can't afford it anymore. Yeah. And we're starting to touch into this world of why are there more display painters in other parts of the world other than America? And that's because they are able to do that kind of career in art and be able to afford things like health insurance and stuff like that and not and not have that issue. Because it's included in most European countries. Right. Yeah. And so, and so that, that makes sense. They can do that career and they can support that lifestyle uh, in, in that particular yeah, area. The cost we of living. We're not so fortunate, unfortunately. And we're also kind of... a we're also kind of dealing with the um, the the pay structure, the payout, the income possibility is kind of based on the U.S. dollar too. Yeah, yeah. So three hundred dollars to do a uh, a box art for a company. Three hundred dollars. Listen, there was a miniature. Three hundred dollars. There was there was a miniature painter that we know that um, maybe a year ago now kind of went off on social media telling people to quit taking $300 for box arts, that that's not good for the environment of our hobby. It's not good for people trying to do this as a profession. People are lowballing people to to take less money because the companies are, well, they'll, they'll just kind of pay the lowest hanging fruit of a certain quality level. And that dollar amount was stated. That's why I said that. Okay. So I'm just curious. Do you think that's enough for the box art job? I don't know. I, I, don't, do you, I don't think so I don't think at that's all. anywhere fucking near enough. No. Well, it depends on the model, of course, right? Uh, yeah. It's um, probably add another zero on that, and we should start talking. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> okay. Whew. I <sighs> thought we were in a totally different, like, uh, train of thought here. But, yeah, like, that needs to be way higher. Um, it should be. It should be way higher. But the yeah. market dictates yes. what it costs. Yes. yes. And if people are doing that, and I agree with this artist that said that that you we are you know you're chopping each other off at the ankles yep in order if if that's what we're doing but that's just it the more people that are have of a certain level are entering the field then there's more you know kind of competition and what's a company willing to pay also these companies if they're saying they can't pay more than that then maybe you need a different business model yeah Maybe yeah. So okay, I figured it out. Here's here's how you determine if you're a professional miniature painter. Okay, we got it. We when got there. You, when your value offering is unique enough to the point where people care to invest in it, and that can be either you have a low price and that's valuable. You paint in a style that is unique to you and is not replicatable, and that's value. So you have a value offering that is unique and compelling and people are willing to invest in it, whatever it is, whether yeah. it's monetary or skill driven. Yeah. It's investing. I mean, investing could be wanting to do the box art. Investing could be they want you to, um, you know, teach at a convention and you can charge a good amount and students will pay it. Yeah. That's a big part. It, it can mean you have a Patreon and people are willing to pay for it, like yeah. direct to consumer thing. Yeah. Or like maybe like uh, is there a is there a career in the world of advising on like the sculpts for 32 millimeter models or like any kind of model like 
like maybe you don't have the sculpting skills, but uh, you can consult and be like these, like these certain details need to be in this certain way, like consulting for a company. I think Alfonso Geraldes does that a lot. He's also a sculptor um, in a huge way, but I know he also advises and scales 75 sculpts like to make well, them he's more employed, paintable. He's employed by them. So. Yeah, but he has like the weirdest career with him. I don't really even know what it is. Um, I don't think they know what it is. I mean, yeah, <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's redefining itself uh, often. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. It's a very artsy approach to business. Yeah. Oh, we don't have to know. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, at the end of the day, my thought about this is like, this is more important to this pointless discussion than it is in reality, right? If, let me give you a great example. Okay. I'll give you two examples. One, uh, the great Willie Hanna, and two, one Vince Vincerella. Neither of those, by definition, are professional miniature painters. Neither of those are use it as their main source of income. And yet, and neither of them have had a certifi certification in miniature painting. And yet, Will Hahn is in very recent memory, as recent as this same year, has won the greatest like awards you could win in miniature painting. Vince Venturella has a a backlog and a a list of his accomplishments and of consistent high level work for years. And it's insane how much he pumps out at a high level. And neither of those guys are professional. If I were to ask either of them, does it matter to you that you're not a professional or do you consider yourself a professional? Whatever they decide or whatever they respond with that, I'd say, great, because that does not take away from their catalog of work, from their skill set, from how the public views them. So what's the point of the word? What's the point? It's just to, is it? Is it a level of your own, um, like, just worry about yourself to feel like I, I feel like I should have to say this? Or or is it a way to try to put people in boxes to say he is a professional and he isn't or she's a professional and he isn't? I think that's a huge thing. I think people, humanity in general, loves to categorize and put them yep. in boxes, right? And it's that's also, how you say who's good and who's not. Right. right? It also gives you a goal, like a, a, on a more positive note, it gives you a goal for like what to strive toward if you want to be that kind of thing. Like what are, what are the qualifications for it? But also, yeah, it's, an, it's another way to label people um, and stuff like that. Yeah. I got a question for you that uh, might be a little, maybe a little depressing. Uh, not, 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 that's, that's, that's wrong word. Um, if you had never started YouTube, could do you think you could cut it as a – professional miniature painter in the like the most basic definition uh so making a living just doing it no youtube allowed no podcast before youtube none of it no so no social outreach just your painting ability and how far that carries you on instagram and patreon and whatever do you think you you could you could cut it in a year i don't think i could no <laughs> i don't think i could either i don't not maybe not maybe in like four three years right. like of really fucking working at it but like because i would paint display models and no one would give a shit about that <laughs> you know i'd I think get a couple you, I think commissions you, i and think stuff. you could you would could be very good at that sure yeah 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 yeah. uh i don't think it would sustain like my lifestyle though Here, here's my here's my thought on that well one if i needed to pay for health insurance no i wouldn't even stop. i wouldn't even begin <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't even start um here's the thing and i think this is true of both of us if we started out with that being our goal, and that's what we're trying to do, somewhere along the line, fairly early on, we would integrate into it, whether it would be Twitch streaming, more, but more directly, you'd, in you'd integrate Patreon. Because that's a really big part of this. Yeah, a lot of people do that. most creators. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, you, I think of even people like Richard Gray is such a prime example. Richard Gray doesn't have all this stuff out there everywhere that is promoting himself you know he but he's got an, a very successful patreon his whip pictures good old richard gray whip never a completed model uh, <laughs> <laughs> on instagram are phenomenal yeah um and he having met him a couple of times 
Um, he's just a shy, soft-spoken guy. Yeah, yeah. You and I would get into this, and then after about a week of like posting Patreon like videos of us painting, we would quickly inject more of our dumbass personality into that, and that would then set us on a different trajectory entirely because yeah. there's a level of the things that we get enjoyment out bring satisfaction to that are not just the tangible picture and video and execution yeah i think it would the path that you're on for each of us in this journey whether it's for miniature painting or some other part of your life is do not fight the current yeah and we would end up like we'd be like we're gonna, we're gonna i'm gonna fucking beat curl canna of mss next year you know i that's what i'd start with and then within six months i'd be like Pew! i'd be way over here <laughs> and i'd be making stupid fart noises in my videos and <laughs> shit like that so you know it's like uh, we're all on our own trajectories and just you know be you and what really drives you and excites you i have a fun richard gray story uh a long time ago, I remember when I first discovered Richard Gray, Richard Gray's Instagram, and he had like this was like maybe like maybe like five six years ago. He had like double digits, sorry, five figure followers on his Instagram. He had like fifty k, sixty k, seventy k followers, and I was like, holy shit! I have never found a miniature painter that has this kind of pull. What is going on? And I looked at his posts, and he has tons of tons of likes, and he had he had he had a lot of tags. And I didn't use tags in my posts uh, back then. And so what I did was I literally copied and pasted the tags oh, he used. Oh, he used <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because he used the same ones every single post. I copied and pasted them and used them on all of my posts at that time. So if you, like, go back, if you uh, – no one's going to do that. So if you compare the, the posts at a similar time frame, they're the exact same tags. I just totally, just totally stole it right from them. Yeah. <laughs> just, like, rubbing your evil hands <laughs> together. You know – if people are going to do the work to figure out what works, you know, if Mr. Beast is going to show me how to make a good YouTube video and shit, or if, if, if Linus Tech Tips is going to show me, like, what, what's a good thumbnail, and then they've done the market research, and they got the team to do it, I'm going to fucking steal that work, you know? That, that's the whole thing, right? They're, they're the first one to get to that point of view, but, you know, I'm going to take that knowledge they've uh, accrued and, and use it for myself. So same, same for Richard Gray. He probably figured out a good combination of, of keywords, and I just fucking stole them all. Yeah, I don't think that's I don't think that's stealing at all. I no, think that is the history of humanity is learning from those that yep. have had success before you. Yep. Instead of like, you know, when a new car company comes out, when Tesla first launched, they didn't like have to like rediscover how wheels work. <laughs> right. That's yeah. not stealing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that is just learning from and adapting and improving on if, if maybe uh, over time. So yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah. And you have there. There is a. It's super value to being the first one to finding something. So yeah. they're still on top. Don't worry. I thought you were gonna. I thought the story was gonna go a dark place. A like, dark place. I was like, oh yeah. And I, uh, I I messaged him, and Richard Gray told me, oh yeah, all you got to do is go to this, you know, Chinese website, and you can pay, you can buy, you can buy followers, <laughs> no, you no, can no. buy likes, and it's really freaking easy. It's like twelve bucks a month, and whatever. <laughs> I thought that's where it was gonna go with things. Scott Scott tells the whole world that it's like. Oh, <laughs> All my Instagram followers are fake. No, luckily not that. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> you could also do that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that about it for this topic? Yeah, I think we came to the conclusion that it, it doesn't matter. It's a waste of time. You it's know. a waste of time. It, appreciate appreciate people that, that you appreciate in the hobby. Take classes from people that you uh, appreciate their work or how they teach or you've heard great things about them. Follow people that inspire you. The title is is irrelevant. Yeah, you know, it is. Yeah, you'll make it if you can make it. If not, it's not a measure of whether or not you're a pro. Mm. All right, we are here with the late breaking news, which is neither late nor breaking. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's probably late. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's probably late. <laughs> first one is the World Championships of Warhammer are coming up November 16th through 19th with 340 players from over 40 countries coming to compete in 40K, Age of Sigmar, Kill Team, and Underworlds. And it'll be live streamed on the Warhammer Twitch channel. Okay, so I went through and I read this article. I mean, skim slash read, a little, little bit of column A, a little bit of column B there. And I kept looking for, I kept looking for that thing. I kept looking for it. Kept reading, kept looking for it, kept reading. Nope. There's no prizes. None? None. They don't mention prizes literally anywhere. 
There's got to be a trophy. The fuck is the point? There's got to be a trophy, bro. You cannot tell me the world championship shit, and you're you're bringing people from 40 countries over to compete, and they have this whole point system and how all these things work, and you get zero fucking dollars. Oh, you want dollars? I want something. I want something. Here's why you're wrong. That's what Vince. This is, this is what Vince would say if you wanted to do a cash tournament gaming. Well, you situation. want to have actual champions. You want people actually playing the heart at the highest possible level. You put a fucking carrot there, bud. Yeah, dude. Well, you, I mean, is is bragging rights enough of a carrot? Made me think about the Olympics, right? Yeah, no cash. Um, I mean, they get uh, athletes get sponsored to train and whatever, and then they get paid. To, to train and get ready. Yes, that it's, is true. It's different yes. in different countries, too. Like, you're in fucking Russia, dude. You're living like a fucking czar as you're a Olympic athlete. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You get paid by an organization to compete. And, and then you get that fucking Wheaties money afterwards, bud. Wheaties. Yeah, yeah so, you know, if, if if GW says, like, okay, for the, the champion in each of these four things, we're going to then have you – we're going to sponsor you for a calendar year – or whatever in perpetuity to be the face of this and you'll get paid to be on advertisements or we'll have you on to do a special strategy articles and you get paid for that or or you get an actual fucking gold medal that worst case scenario you can fucking sell that thing for scrap for like eight grand <laughs> i don't know something i know this isn't the olympics but this goes back to my thought that this is not an actual competitive game it's not. It's just not because they cannot give money because it's a fucking crap shoot. John is fired up. I fucking hate this. I hate <laughs> this. This is so this is so ridiculous. It does not have to be directly cash, but you have to commit something. They gotta have a trophy. They gotta have the fucking coolest shit ever. That's worth it's, it's gotta be worth something. Like it's gotta be old, worth something. Like the golden deem would the slayer sword be worth something to you? An equivalent thing to that. Uh it doesn't have the the history of this of the competition, the the, the gumption. Because I feel like Golden Demon's closer to the to the Olympics than this trying to make a tournament thing work. Yeah, yeah. And so when you're going, when you don't have the history, you have to rev up that fucking engine hard from the start to to show our commitment. And the company makes so much fucking money, and they ain't paying their employees with the money. So where's the money going? <laughs> Andy Smiley, he gets it all. <laughs> it's just, it's just like six old white dudes. They get all the money. Yeah. Uh, it's us shareholders. I get it. But no, if like if you're really committed and you really can stand behind your game and you think this is an actual competitive game that you want to to that the best of the best will continually rise to the top because the game is not who got the most double turns and who rolled the most sixes over the course of one thousand dice rolls, then. Put your money where your mouth is, motherfuckers. Uh, yeah, I think I think what Vince would say to this, because I kind of agree to you. I, I want to live in a world where we can have cash prizes for gaming tournaments. But I think the problem is that because these games aren't like omega balanced, the, a cash prize brings out the worst in a game system. It brings out the win at all cost players because, of course, you're going to play like that. And for a game like Warhammer Age of Sigmar, where there's 28, 26 factions... Like, the, there's no chance you've, like, figured out all the angles and, and fixed all the problems and there are no busted lists, right? And they're going to come out. They're going to come out. And that isn't fun. That, that, and that's not what Warhammer and playing war games is about. So I feel like that's, like, the, the, de the devil's argument for why cash prices aren't going to work in a system like... I 100% agree. I 100% agree. And so, maybe the question is: are, are there any war games that that would work for? You know, are they all in a similar boat? Like, obviously, GW is one to pick on because they have such a huge fucking game. But are any games, you know, good for cash prizes? I don't know. My my rebuttal to that remark is: yeah, then you do not market or create an event and advertise it as the World Championships of Warhammer. Okay, so this is the expectation. Yes, they, no one set the expectations but themselves. Okay, what would, what would it be called then? What, what should you call it? It would just be call it like the the grand get together. Okay, the big like, BBQ. Yeah, it's just like whatever is the whatever is the theme of the state of Minnesota, the great Minnesota get together, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the great Warhammer get together. <laughs> I don't know, but see the thing is, is they. They are selling you a bill of goods that they have no intention on cashing. Okay. They they are selling you something that does not exist. I can get behind what you're saying right now because this also pisses me off when like 
expectations are set and they're just like not met. Like you're on a different page than the, yeah. than the creator or the organizer. So I get that. I love when we went to Nova and we go to Adepticon and you go around the tournament halls and people are playing in the big ones, even at fucking LVO, this m- m- world's most massive 40K tournament. People are there laughing, they're rolling dice, they're playing sketchy lists, they're whatever. And they flew all the way to Las Vegas. They entered this massive tournament. They're playing for two like eight, ten hour days, maybe day three if they get to the whatever the end. But they're there because they love the game and they're having fun and they're creating memories and they're meeting new people and they're doing all these things. That is your game. Yeah. Let that be your game. Yes, there's always the pull and push on the balancing and that should be a thing because people care about it and people want to play their cool toys and feel like they're not, they haven't lost before they get down. But there's a difference between that and it being like, playing in the WNBA finals like yeah, there's there, there's a, such a vast gap there do not advertise one to me when the other is what really what really matters and you know what I'm also fine if they have this like super exclusive 16 people tournament by invite only of the highest placing people through the point system throughout the year and it's like these 16 there will be one world champion of Warhammer and they're going to walk away with a check with $10,000 this is that event does not does not skew the masses, right? Because it's just a small one of people that did really, really well and they won these big tournaments. Well, guess what? The people that win those big tournaments are the neckbeard tryhards that will put all the fucking sketchy ass Bolton boys or whatever the fuck it listed is in the Song of Ice and Fire that you just put all that neutral unit in spam because it's broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Golden, golden sword company. I think you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, you're right, and that that is how TI works. There's a there's a pro circuit that gets gets you points for events. Top eight teams in that list get in. Eight more teams get in through qualifiers, through these wild card events, and then you have 16 teams that then play for the grand finals. Yeah. So that that could absolutely be a format for a legitimate world championship. Because yeah. you have you have the point system already. Someone's doing the work for you. Uh, so just leverage it. Yeah, As a, there was just like uh, three weeks ago. There was a hundred thousand dollar magic tournament. Wasn't even like world champs. Wasn't whatever. Yeah, hundred thousand dollar cash prize. Yeah, or it was total payout. Yeah, but like one of the stream or streamers YouTubers that I watch, um, he he placed like I don't remember what it was. It was like twenty something, twenty eighth or whatever, something something something. And he still won like eight grand. Yeah, it was like. It was just a fucking, it's just a two day magic tournament. Yeah, and some like third party organization set it up, something like that. It's like, what the, f- what? I mean, okay. Um, I mean, this is, it, it's, I, my frustration with all of this is not to be misconstrued as me hating Games Workshop or hating Warhammer. It is, it's kind of the opposite. I, I, you're passionate about the things that frustrate you because you care about them. Mm hmm. And one way or the other, I just want them to to not pull the bait and switch on me. Commit to one thing. But if you're going to commit to that, and I'm like, commit to this World Championships of Warhammer, then actually commit to it. Bro, they don't commit to anything. Space yeah. Marines are all things. They are good guys. They are bad guys. They are great guys. Okay? This is the uh, company that does not commit. Yeah. Their, their, their history is vast and all encompassing. <laughs> yeah. Their game is all things to all people, yeah. which obviously that's like a great business model. Um, it's just, it is literal shotgun approach. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the Games Workshop and Forge World website got merged into one big website. And I didn't know this was happening, but I showed up to the site on the day it was happening and it, there was a wait time. So I. <laughs> wait time? Website? Yeah, so I went to I went to gamesworkshop.com and I got f- sent to q.warhammer. some insane token, and it was like you have to wait for seven minutes to get a fifteen minute shopping session. And I just wanted to look at Necromunda warbands. That's all I wanted to do. Oh, look at pictures, bud. That's, that's lit. That's all. Look at pictures, literally. Is and there a button you can press? I just want to look at pictures. <laughs> <laughs> there should be. Ain't uh, no one buying on this site. Who buys on the Warhammer official website? They, there are people. There are people. Also, whenever you go to a Games Workshop store and they don't have a thing you want, mm. the first thing the employee is taught is to get the person to buy it off of the web store. It comes to the store for free, no shipping, because they don't have everything in their catalog. So that that maybe that's also a thing. Um, but anyways. What? They don't have everything in the catalog? Oh, God, no. What? No way. It's like they go to Apple store and then like they don't, it's like they just don't have the latest iPhone? Like, well, I mean, the Apple's got... 40 SKUs and GW's got like 7,000. So it's like a little bit harder, I think. Sure. Um, 
But. Oh, I thought you were going to push the sure button. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Random button. Here's why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think. Um, Sorry, I, I went to the website. I had to wait. I got in. It, it was working fine. It worked okay. I had a couple of issues where the website crashed after the seven minute wait, and I had to fucking redo it. Uh, Isn't that the whole point of the wait list so it doesn't crash? <laughs> I don't even get the wait list in the first place. It's no. like you had your website up and working for years. And it's like, do you think you're suddenly going to get more traffic now that you've just kind of changed the skin a little bit? It's like, no, dude. I didn't get that at all. Dude, it's all that Forge World traffic. You know, when, yeah, they mer- when, they, when those lanes merge, that's seven people that are on ForgeWorld.com. See, just like, like, that was something I didn't know going into it. I didn't know they had merged. So I was looking at Necromunda stuff, and I was like, man, look at all these sick one-off Necromunda characters. They're so awesome. And then I noticed it said 15 plus in the corner. And then I noticed it had a little label that said expert kit. And I was like, oh, is that how you talk about your shitty resin casting? It's like, you need to have a, a baseline of skill to deal with our bullshit. You need to be a professional miniature <laughs> painter. No 14 year olds allowed, bro. Um, so yeah, then I was like, oh, they're combined together. Forge World and GW are now one website. So it was cool. It looks a little flashier. It looks, I don't know, it's not like a huge difference. People were really hating on it, but maybe just after the couple first days of the, that queue bullshit, now it's now it's fine. I, I shouldn't be in a queue anymore, right, Games Workshop? Oh, let's let's do it live. All right, we're going to go to... Is it Warhammer.com? I think it's that, or I'll try Games Workshop as well, see what happens. Warhammer.com. Yeah, now it changes to Warhammer.com, so it, it is that, and it works immediately. Okay, There's no, no on, I, got, I got to accept cookies. I got to put America's USA English... So I have to check the box and then hit the X to get rid of the what nation am I in? I guess. That is uh There's no go button? Yeah. Pushing this, the country should just get me out of that yes. thing. But that's, that's a usability thing. Yeah, I'm not having to wait in line here. Uh, been, everyone was so excited to... Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a nice uh, mobile format. Yeah. Hit shop here. Maybe that's maybe that was the biggest change. They made it nicer for mobile. So now I'm like I'm like looking through the Age of Sigmar armies. It's a lot. It's a lot more straightforward. I wonder if they used my Squarespace link to make this website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say I would say it's definitely more mobile friendly. Uh, just in this very brief anecdotal uh, little test we just did. The guy on the cover kind of looks like me. Yeah. What? Like he kind of looks like me. No, he fucking doesn't. <laughs> the fuck? No. What? Okay, maybe he doesn't. What? Hold on, why do you think that? I don't know. He just, hold, on, not, hold on, now I need to look again. His nose is very similar to mine. Oh, maybe that's what it is. Okay, hold on. Now I, I feel like I need to give you time of day. I mean, don't look at the fact, I mean, he's a different nationality, but just his <laughs> facial structure is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Similar. I'm going to check, I'm going to check. Okay, yeah, yeah you're if right. Go, if I go down like this, my face down like this. No, no, put your arm out, put your arm out. Yeah, this is your, this is your brother, right? The, the nose, the nose is right. You're right about the nose. All right, Games Workshop, you use me for your pictures <laughs> on your goddamn website. This is an AI modified version. <laughs> yeah. Let's check. Count the number of fingers. How many <laughs> fingers? Is, yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. A lot of people were really uh, angry. Even James uh, says, and the new website is awful. It seems impossible, but it's somehow worse than before. Collapsing menus on websites are the enemy. Oh, maybe this is a PC thing. Uh, oh, yeah. I can't remember. Um. All right. I mean, a lot of people other than James also are ha- are having a lot of issue with the website. So it's not just him. Okay. And the last one on here, I didn't look at it too closely, but this was cool. My buddy sent me a link to this though. If you do know, you know what humble bundles are probably hum- hum- humble bundle is where yeah. you get the good deals for video games. Yeah. So it goes towards charity, and you pay what you want, and you get just like an insane amount of video games, uh, mostly on Steam. Uh, mm-hmm. But this is a humble bundle for. Uh, STLs. I better check this out. 161 miniatures started with 25 bucks is like the recommended minimum donation. I, I don't know if you have to pay that. I can't remember. It says pay one dollar or more. Yeah, so I think you can. I don't know. Maybe there are tiers that you can invest at. But okay, the, we they, can they do, do the math here because it says 3,416 sold, and this bundle is raised 8,175 dollars for charity. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, it's like two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. <laughs> Average. Yes. So you kind of, I mean, yeah. So that that's that's pretty cool. I I like that they're doing something like this on Humble Bundle, or you know, just like diversifying the where you're getting uh, STLs or or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They they've done like books in the past. They've done like Warhammer video games exclusively, or video games from a certain publisher like THQ or Bethesda. 
Do you scroll yeah. through the models at all? I have not. I uh, I don't need more you're STOs. N- you're not missing out. No. I mean, if there are some. Um, there are some just at a glance. Some that are promising. Like this one where the Boy, this lady, howdy. this uh, lady archer is riding a bear. But look at the bear. He's just like sit down. He's like he's not having anything with it. No. And like these dudes. Yeah, those cal or those infantry guys are rough. I don't know, but I don't know who did this. You get you make one hundred and sixty one oh, models. You're gonna terrain. There's terrain. Though. Okay, yeah, the terrain. The terrain might be. Oh, look at the minecart shit. Oh, there's dead bodies. Yeah. Okay. Oh man. Oh, they're gonna get me. I gotta quit scrolling. The terrain might be worth. Oh yeah, little, little crystals. You see the crystals? No. Show me the crystals. I almost forgot the crystals. The crystals. Hey, those are nice. Yeah. Every time little bitsy bits, terrain bits, that kind of thing, it just does it for me. Yeah. It's flexibility. I'm putting it wherever I need to put it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That'll wrap up the news. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you for hanging out all the way to the end to listen to us hammer on about fucking Dota TI, Halloween candy, what competitive miniature wargaming looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it feels like we mm. didn't talk about any particular thing, and yet we talked for so long. Yeah. So what, long. What, what were we at for recording time here? With oh, We're at two hours and 46 minutes, so that camera is about to run out of SD card space. So let's wrap it up. Uh-oh. If you like this podcast and you want to support it, there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, if you got some cash to spend, you can spend it on our Patreon, where you get access to an extended version of this podcast, about 20, 30 minutes longer. This podcast was about 30 minutes extra content. Yeah. Uh, you also get the opportunity to suggest topics, like today Scuba Steve gave us a topic. Scuba Steve. Scuba Steve. You also get the ability to submit a model to give feedback to. We did Dark Panzer today and his Horus Heresy era Blood Angels, we think. It's his, um, own, it's his own reliquary chapter. Yes. And so so that, that is also another thing you get. Uh, also, if you don't got five bucks, you can just do one buck a month. We have both of those options available to you. You can check out our merch store in the description as well. Teespring's got a lot of fun shirts, a lot of fun pants, a lot of fun cups. There's probably like a uh, what's what's the thing that you hit and candy comes out of it? A pinata. There should be a top pinata on there. I think Teespring does that by now, probably. I uh, got. I hope so. <laughs> uh, otherwise, if you don't got any cash to spend, uh, you can just uh, uh, share our podcast with your friends. You can rate us on wherever you're listening to podcasts, whether it's an audio version or a YouTube version. Leaving a comment, leaving a like, all that, all that interaction helps out a lot. We'll catch you in a fortnight. But until then, we'll see you on the the pretty flop.